Welcome, first of all, to World uh, Trade uh, Center Week here at the port. We're really excited to celebrate trade and have a robust discussion with all of you. Um, just as a matter of housekeeping, I hope everyone does uh, get a sandwich because we want to keep you fueled up. We're going to be sitting here until 2 o'clock and we have a really exciting agenda lined up, so we want to make sure you're well fed. And um, just as if, if there, we don't expect any situations, but of course, just out of due diligence, there's exit doors, four of them here in this room. So just make sure you mark where those are. And then the restrooms are just out here to your right and around the corner if you need to use the facilities. So without further ado, we are going to get underway because we have a lot of uh, dignitaries in the room with us and we have a lot to talk about and, and really celebrate trades. So I am going to call up the Vice President of our board to make our opening remarks. Please join us in welcoming Marion Rooney, Commissioner Marion Rooney. Thank you so much for being here to help us celebrate World Trade Week. And uh, we are honored that all of you took time out of your day to be uh, with us as we um, embark upon the conversation today. I know that it's going to be an exciting conversation. The day will go quickly, and, um, and we're glad that all of you are here. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge some folks. There's a number of them, so if you don't mind just holding your applause, um, and the um, VIPs can stand up. As they're, as they're called. Um, first of all, we have the mayor of Port Miami, Mr. Tom Fitt, um, John Sharkey, council member, council member from the city of Ventura, Cheryl Heitman, the uh, mayor pro tem from the city of Oxnard is Carmen Ramirez, and then we have a field representative for Congresswoman Julie Brownlee, Jason Barnes, and uh, from the uh, Office of Senator Kamala Harris, Julie Chavez Rodriguez. And then um, we also have from State Senator Hannah Beth Jackson's office, Brad Jackson. So let's give them all, oh wait, 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 I have a couple more. Um, sorry about that. Also from the Southern California District Export Council is Megan Cullen and David Habib. And then um, to include all of this, we can't make, oh, oh yep, more team, thank you very much. Um, Martine Hernandez is here from Supervisor Kelly Long's office as well. So um, we can't make any of this happen without our customers. It's our customers that make Cargo Move here at the Port of Wainini, and they're doing the work every day. So as um, if you're a customer of the port, along with everybody else, I'd like to give us all a round of applause to everyone here today. So we know that uh, e-commerce is a profound force in the international marketplace with an effect on business located all over the world. It has all but removed barriers between businesses and customers on a global scale. Never before have customers been able to locate, contact, and do business with a myriad of vendors, all with a minimum hassle and without anything to do but just a few clicks away. Before e-commerce, the way to start a business was to open a physical shop and hope that your audience was, in, was within walking distance or driving distance so they could find you. But today, more and more people are starting businesses with lower startup costs, and that's all thanks to the e-commerce platform. Even with the smallest of businesses, they can market to and provide their products to businesses worldwide. In Ventura County, e-commerce has opened doors for local businesses to reach 95% of the market outside of the United States. Not only has e-commerce changed the landscape for emerging businesses, it has opened significant doors for established companies to expand to a truly global marketplace. This transfer of goods on a global scale has fueled growth in both the international trade and transportation, as many of our speakers and panelists today will elaborate on. E-commerce has altered traditional relationships, fostered new supply networks, and force businesses to adapt with improvements in everything from efficiency to fulfillment times. Today, the challenge at hand is to keep up with the new digital trends and technologies to make sure that the marketing and fulfillment efforts stay one step ahead of intensified competition as we all try to reach the 3.7 billion internet users worldwide. I would argue that e-commerce is the single most powerful change to the business environment since the invention of the automated production line. Disruptive technologies that change the landscape of business 
has always been greeted with both caution and hope. But e-commerce is beyond disruptive. And at the very least, it has shifted paradigms of commerce. At the most, it has been revolutionary. It impacts both developing nations and powerhouse economies. It crosses economic, political, and cultural bar barriers. And it breaks down the walls in the marketplace. It opens up a world of opportunity, literally, and it shows no signs of slowing down. So we'd like to thank you all for being here to celebrate with us. And I first would like to call up the mayor of uh, Port Wainini um, for his comments. Mr. Fitt. Welcome, and uh, thank you, Marianne. Um, this is the Friendly City by the Sea. I hope uh, those that are not familiar with this territory gets familiar with Friendly City by the Sea. Uh, Marianne, I don't disagree with your assessment. Your customers are critically important, but we like to think that your success is also due to your partnerships. And we would like to think that the City of Fort Wayne plays a role in that. Um, most of you know that the American pastime is baseball. And I have a proclamation here I consider to be a triple play. Um, obviously, we're here to celebrate Trade Week. But there are two other milestones that are worthy of recognition. Uh, one is that this is the 80th anniversary of the establishment of the Oxnard Harbor District and ultimately the construction of uh, Port of <coughs> And the second milestone, it's now 25 years that the city, excuse me, the port, has been declared a port of entry that's allowed for the kind of commerce that, that they're now realizing. And we want to continue to facilitate that. Now, I have a proclamation I can read. It's about 20 minutes long. Would you? Or I could just dispense with that um, and say that one of the contributions that the city most recently has tried to extend a uh, uh, helpful hand uh, is setting up a uh, sister city arrangement with the Port of Ensenada, actually the city of Ensenada. The Port of Ensenada is already a sister port for uh, the Port of Wainini. And our hope is that we could collaborate as being ambassadors when it comes to the cultural, social side of uh, the equation to facilitate, to support, uh, to be a partner in the uh, trade process of the harbor as it relates to that particular uh, entity uh, through which a lot of the uh, agricultural products come through. So uh, I'm here simply to pass on the uh, proclamation. Uh, I know you have a lengthy agenda, so I'll keep it at that. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, so we're going to move right into the meat of our program. Our first panel is with our customer panel, and Donna Lacayo, who is our chief commercial officer, is going to moderate this panel. I, Donna's been with us for three years now. She's been just a, a fresh of breath air when it comes to business development. She's really uh, stimulated a lot of new activity here. We've seen take ups in business, and she's just a go getter, and we're really pleased to have her on our team. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Donna to uh, moderate this session. Thank you. Great to see everyone here today. A lot of new faces and a lot of old friends. I appreciate you coming today. I couldn't have done all of this by myself. Thank you for the introduction. It's all about our partners and um, the entire board and um, just everyone that's here today. So thank you. So I have a quick update on how our trade is doing here at the port and then we'll move into the customer panel. So um, here we go. How are we doing? Things are great at the Port of Wainimi. Uh, cargo segments, as you know, the largest uh, cargo segments we have here are fruit and cars. In the last fiscal year, we sell about 60% of our revenue to come from cars. Um, and as far as fruit, we'll see it in the next chart here, it's actually grown a lot, especially the fresh fruit exports, which we'll celebrate here today as well. Uh, Revenue-wise, we are forecasted to do about 1.5 million cargo tons this year and about 15 million in revenue. Um, and as far as auto imports and exports, we had our best year ever in uh, auto imports and exports in fiscal year uh, 2016. Um, about 340,000 cars, 37,000 of them were exports. That was great. Uh, for the fruit side, this is a great story. We see the bananas coming right back up. Over 
thousand tons projected. And also with the introduction of brand new service, sea land, uh, we're seeing a lot more fresh food imports and exports, over 40% projected growth in just fresh food segment uh, for this fiscal year. Uh, also seeing great support from Yara, fertilizer has grown over the last uh, year or so. And what are we up to here? What are the projects that we're busy with working to improve the port to make sure that it continues to carry all the business and more? Uh, we're dredging, we're at 35 feet right now, we're going down to 40 feet, this project is starting in September. Uh, we're also modernizing the terminal, making it so it can handle more cars and more containers. We see a lot of the food moving into container site. And we also finished our shore side power project, so all three birds in the south terminal now can plug in with the container ships that come in here every week. And as I mentioned, expanding in capacity, projects are in the works to uh, perhaps uh, we're looking for opportunity to build a parking structure in port, and that would pretty much double our auto handling capacity, 7,500 cars, and uh, it's just a very, um, a very uh, good project we're working on right now. So under our umbrella of World Trade Center license, we're celebrating today trade. We're connecting businesses, we're connecting government, and we're looking into the future and seeing how we can work together, what is going on here in this, in this port, in this county, with our customers, that we can continue on this import and export that we're all benefiting from, and um, just continue the strategic partnerships. So with that, I'm going to go into our customer panel. And um, the first one that we have today, thank you all for coming. I know how busy you are. I appreciate you making it. Um, it is going to be Al Cardona. Al Cardona is with BMW, and he's an experienced professional that has been with BMW North America for quite some time. 25. 25 years, thank you. He uh, actually was, uh, oh, sorry. He was actually in China for five years before he came back to Oxnard, a VDC Vehicle Distribution Center, um, last year, and we're happy to have him back. I have a quick video that I wanted to show you about BMW before um, Al says a few words. Actually, it's a PowerPoint, I'm sorry. Yeah. Al, let me see yeah. you, Michael. You can just click. Uh, sure. Good morning. Yeah. Yeah, can you give me a pic? No. Oh. I'll start that. It's okay. That's okay. Good. Sure. So good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll uh, try to keep it simple. So we just go uh, uh, the slides along the way. It's nothing uh, fancy. Just to tell you a little bit about the company, uh, because there's a little bit of misconception about BMW. Uh, we are not one of the big guys, uh, for sure. Uh, we're very proud of who we are. So if you go to the next slide, uh, please. Uh, I don't to go to the slide. Right? Right. Right. OK, so. Who we are? Uh, well, let me start with the big guys. We own Rolls Royce for a number of years, uh, independent of Rolls Royce uh, airplane engines. It's a separate company. We both have exactly the same name, but we own Rolls Royce motor cars. We also own Mini and, of course, uh, BMW. Under the BMW brand, what do we do? Well, we do vehicles, motorcycles, and, of course, uh, electric cars as well. Our brands. The i cars, you see the i8, uh, or let's say flagship, if you want to call it, very fancy uh, sport vehicle. We have a new one coming out that was going to be wonderful. You would see it in due time, 2019. Uh, i3 is right now the vehicle that we're selling the most. This is the all electric car. Uh, again, there's a new one coming out that we look significantly different than the one that we have right now. I've been very excited, 2019 time frame. Uh, of course, BMW, GLK, uh, GKL stands basically for the large vehicle, the 7 Series and the 5 Series, and we continue uh, to sell those cars. Uh, and performance, that's basically the core of the company. We are an engineering company that uh, builds uh, perfect cars for hunting, and I'll stress that. We really do. That's what brings apart from the competition. We have very good competition. We respect our competition. Uh, that makes us stronger as well, and actually they bring some of the cars to the port. Uh, Mini, of course, uh, I already mentioned that, Rolls Royce, and then uh, motorcycles. Motorcycles are, all of these vehicles are brought to one Mini, except the, the motorcycles. Those are brought uh, via New Jersey. Technology-wise, we are the forefront. BMW uh, participates 
and invests heavily into technology, intelligent assistance, electromobility, fuel cells, high power engines, uh, high efficiency engines, so on and so forth. And then environmental. We try to do everything as green as possible. You know, all of this public information that you can see. But this is about trade. So we've been here for about 29 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to pour one in. We own the facility just up the road from here. We have 24 acres. And we just entered into an agreement with the port uh, where we will uh, purchase about nine and a half acres within the next uh, couple of years or so. We're very excited about that. We've been here and we're here to stay. Uh, yeah. Six, <laughs> six uh, is the number of uh, countries where we uh, import from Germany, Austria, the Netherlands, England, South Africa, and Brazil. So all of those are cars, uh, excuse me, countries where we produce our vehicles of bringing through Porto Guanini along with some other ports on the East Coast. Uh, in addition to that, in 2019, we will bring uh, vehicles from Mexico, uh, from our new plant that is being built there, those more than likely uh, will arrive by uh, short sea uh, from the uh, um, uh, Pacific coast. Uh, and then we also bring cars from South Carolina. Uh, we bring those by rail and they come into our facility across the street uh, <coughs> on the uh, Harbour District uh, rail flow. We have uh, about 125 employees that purchase our vehicles with uh, one of our service providers. Uh, our core business has changed significantly, we continue to change, we, we in, continue to change, and that is related to accessories. We now heavily accessorize our vehicles, so e-commerce. We will sell a, a, a customary vehicle uh, that they, order, uh, they can order online to one of the plants that I just mentioned, and it takes seven weeks, eight weeks from the time that they place the order to the time that it arrives here. During that time, we reach out to that customer and we could upgrade the vehicle, e-commerce. Uh, by the time he or she receives the vehicle, then they could have new fenders, uh, new spoilers, new rims. Uh, the list is endless. It's a, it's a really big business for us. It's the one that has increased the most for our workforce. So, to make it short, Again, we've been here 28 years. We're not going anywhere. We're here to stay. We are investing. I'm very excited. And we really appreciate uh, working with Harvard this team. Okay? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, just a, a, a quick note here. There's a fact Kristen reminded me to mention that BMW is actually um, a German company, but they are one of the largest U.S. manufacturers of cars. The X1 BMWs are made in South Carolina. And you are the largest exporter of U.S. manufactured vehicles um, that is set up in Correct. South Carolina. Correct. So um, it's, a, it's a global, global business. Export, um, sorry, you are 57 countries. 257 countries from, from, South from South Carolina. Uh, next, we have Raquel Cano. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Raquel Cano is the Court Operations Manager for Chiquito Brands International. Um, she is a product of the tropics. Can I say that? <laughs> a very good one. Um, she, her career with Chiquito began in 2005 uh, when she was selected to participate in a training program for recent college graduates. Through her hard work and perseverance, she soon climbed the ranks and she was offered a position for quality control supervisor and she was overseeing a lot of Costa Rican farms there. Um, for, uh, four short years later, she would again be promoted and the time she would find herself responsible for all Chiquita operations and distributions out of Wayne neighborhood. So glad to have you. Uh, not only Ms. Uh, Kano is very effective at what she does, but she also uh, continues to give back to the community. And we really appreciate you being here today. So if you'd like to say a couple of minutes about Chiquita. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, no. This is very intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Now can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction. It's it was very nice, and, and sometimes you don't see yourself like as other people, so <laughs> thank you so much. Um, like Donna said, uh, I've been with the company now for almost 12 years, um, and as you all, I don't know, like you all know, or heard Chiquita, um, the company has been around for more than 100 years. Um, we started 
in the United States in a, in a little like person and I, and I have, like in a little Indiana. Someone else has had. Then they moved to the tropics and expanded. Um, and now the company has around uh, probably 25 own farms and then also other farms that we purchase product. Um, from Mexico down to Ecuador is where we produce our, our bananas. That is the main, uh, the core business of the company. We also have salads, pineapples, and other products, but bananas is the, the, the core business. Um, also, we have ports along the United States. We have five different ports. Wainimi is the only port for um, the West Coast. And it's where we bring our fruit and we distribute through, like I said, the West Coast, Canada, Alaska, and some other states like uh, Colorado, Utah, down uh, center of, of the country. Uh, we've been in Wainimi since 2004. Uh, we came from Long Beach um, in November 2004 as a bulk cargo. Uh, for for the time from 2004 to 2012, we were bringing uh, bananas every week um, as bulk cargo. In 2012, the company decided to ch make the change because it was going to increase quality, it was going to increase volume. So we increased around 50% of our volume just moving from pallets to containers. And, um, and um, we've been doing that for the last uh, five years and now um, I don't know if you all heard a couple of years ago the company was public it got bought by a financial group called Petrales Safra and they these these new owners are putting a lot of um, effort to grow the company and they're proud of the brand they want to increase uh, sales they want to increase their impact not only um, as, as a banana company, but also helping communities. Um, and that's what they want with, with the growth. Um, a year ago, we moved out to, or we were in a third party facility, and we decided, the company decided that doing our own business, doing, controlling our own um, operation was the way to go. Now we employ 30 people along with the people that we uh, employ while we're having our shift here. We bring um, one vessel that now is Chiquita's own vessel. We were charter charting um, before and now, starting in January this year, we are having our own vessels that are called Wainini. And, um, <coughs> and, and um, we bring around 300 containers a week. That is like 16,000 containers a year that if you put it in town, it's like around 300,000 tons a year that are coming to Wainini. And 30% of, of what we export here is uh, commercial cargo that we also want to increase. And we have a, a full team of, of sales representatives in the West Coast trying to increase their business and also get more partnership with, with uh, the tropics. Um, our main our main markets down that we bring here is Mexico and Guatemala, that's where the bananas come from, and that's where we are exporting also all of our Next we have Lopez, Roy, Kircher, and Michael Winsong. Lopez are the importers of Hyundai's and Kia's, and they also are exporters of a lot of US made vehicles like Chrysler, GM products, uh, some Hondas, and Toyotas. Roy Kircher, who represents Globus uh, with Mike, uh, Roy is uh, the general manager for Globus America in Miami. He's well experienced in operations and is known to be uh, very efficient in, in managing a vehicle uh, um, processing centers. Uh, we're pleased to have him here. And Michael Winsong is the Vice President in Government Relations. He's, he's well known in the community. He always gives back. He serves in the Chamber with me, the Chamber of Commerce. And we're glad to have both of them here today. If you'd like to share a couple of words, please. 
Uh, yes, my name is Michael Winsong. Uh, I'm in charge of the community relations here in Fort Miami. Uh, also uh, responsible for the oversight of general affairs. Uh, we opened our first vehicle processing facility in Fort Miami almost two decades ago. Last year, uh, we handled more than 139,000 vehicles, and the vast majority of those were Hyundai and Kias. Our company has continued to grow and is now part of a national logistics provider and subsidiary of Hyundai that supports various areas <coughs> in the supply chain management, and we expect to reach approximately 200,000 units this year. In addition to our operation here in Port Wainimi, we also have uh, four, actually, uh, uh, four other locations now. We, we handle, uh, we have another port operations in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And we handle all of the Hyundai cars that are manufactured in the United States here coming out of uh, Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama. We, and an hour and a half away at uh, the Kia plant in Georgia, we handle all the Kias there. Uh, we recently opened an inland facility in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, where cars that are manufactured in Mexico come in by rail uh, into Shreveport there. And uh, so we've increased our rail product coming through the port here by an additional 60,000 units starting this year. So uh, we expect, as I said earlier, to reach uh, over 200,000 units at the end of this year. Lois's success here in Wainimi exemplifies the unique public-private partnership that uh, we enjoy here with the Oxnard Harbor District uh, or the Port of Wainimi and Globus, and it's only possible because of the close relationship that we have with the port and the community. We're a national company that creates synergy through a sense of togetherness that is fostered by mutual communication and cooperation with the company and our business partners here at the port. Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, Mike pretty much said it all. Um, he, uh, we've been here for quite a few years. I've been with the company for about six years. Um, we've had some great growth in the six years that I've been here and we anticipate that growth to continue into the future. And next we have Mike Wallace with Wilhelmius Wilhelmson Logistics. He's been with the board quite some time. I'm going to say that again. I think it's 20 plus years, isn't it? Yes. yes I want to see how many you're kidding. Um, Mike is the Vice President and General Manager here. Their facilities on Edison Drive, if you've driven down Port Wainini Road, you've seen a lot of cars, brand new cars, Range Rovers, Volvos down the road. They all go into his facility for processing before they go out to the dealers. He's a very experienced executive in the automotive industry and he offers great insight to the transportation service industry and brings a lot of cars to the port, so thank you. Thank you, Donna. Is this working? I'm looking here. Okay, hi. Hi, I'm Mike Wallace, as Donna said. Uh, I've been here uh, working almost 25 years now. Uh, I don't know where the time goes. I think I was kidnapped as a youth here in the area. But anyways, um, WWL is actually, uh, our core business is actually ocean service, and we're a, a, a vessel operator. Uh, one of the biggest, or the biggest actually, uh, vessel operator in the world with row row vessels. What's a row row vessel? That's a vessel that is like a big parking garage uh, on the water, and anything that can roll on and roll off, we put on our vessels. Um, Multi-story uh, vessels that the decks are movable, so you can take high, high equipment and uh, bulk type, type cargo, as well as automotive and auto and truck uh, products as well. So that's our core business, and the uh, ocean side has been around for a number of years, uh, hundreds of years actually. We started in Sweden and Norway with the two families merging, Willenius Lines and Wilhelmsen Lines. And uh, the first vehicle processing center that the ocean business developed was here in Port Wainini. That was our own standalone facility. So in 1992, we opened uh, the facility down the street, as Donna mentioned. Uh, and right there, we have 65 acres that we own and operate. Uh, we have several different customers here, uh, up to nine right now, 
and she mentioned some of them as Land Rover and Jaguar, <coughs> uh, Volvo, Maserati, Aston Martin, Toyota, Mitsubishi, uh, I'm forgetting some, I'm sure. Uh, but a number of different uh, uh, of manufacturers that we operate. So while our core business is ocean, we developed this other business that certainly supports our ocean business, and by consolidating those port calls helps us be more efficient on the ocean side as well. So not only are, is WWO bringing in the cars that I process, you know, not, but our company processes <coughs> in Oxnard and Wainimi, they also bring in Al's cars and other cars as well. So the ocean supports the land-based logistics side of the business. So there's been a lot of growth in Port Wainimi. As I said, it was our first uh, endeavor into the land-based operations from the ocean side. And we chose Wainimi because of the community and because of the port operations. Uh, it was a niche port that deals, you know, as, as we saw, mainly with fruit and, and roll-off, roll-off cargoes. There's some other commodities here as, as well, but those are the primary two big ones. And so it worked out very well with us. We could consolidate our West Coast operations into one port here. And that's our continued hope, is that we can continue to grow here in Port Wainini and uh, develop more uh, land and develop more you know, customer base. We're currently working with several other uh, OEMs or manufacturers to come to this area, and that will bring jobs and continue to trade. So we look forward to many more years with the port, and thank you for having me here today. I appreciate it. And last but not least, we have Casey Dexter with Ports America, Steve Adore. Casey is somewhat new to the Port of Wainimi. You've been with uh, this particular terminal operation for six months or so, or a little less than that? Oh, no. However, <laughs> really? No. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, it seems like you've been here longer because you're so well versed in everything already. But Casey is not new to this. He's been with Ports America for some time, and he actually is a graduate of the Bachelor's in Logistics program from the United States Merchant Marine. And he came to us from uh, Port Operations in Savannah. Uh, he also holds the title Lieutenant, Lieutenant Commander in the United States Navy Reserve and has worked for Ports America for over 13 years on both of the coast. So we're pleased to have him today. Casey, please. Thank you, Donna. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Ports America, if you did not know, is the premier uh, terminal operator and stevedore in North America. Um, we couldn't do this without the partnership of the port and our strong partnership with the ILWU and ILA. We operate in every major port in North America, everything from bulk cargo to break bulk to autos and containers. Here in Wainimi, uh, we own the two cranes you see out there. We do all the container work here roughly 50,000 lifts annually. Um, that's also combined with 250,000 pallets and above. Our five major uh, customers are Chiquita, Del Monte, Sealand, MOL, we do autos as well, with some high and heavy, and our military operations as well. Um, we also are looking to grow our partnership with the port here and looking to expand with more cranes and additional container management for them. Customer and partners, a speaker panel. And um, next, you know, yes. yes, we understand you're very busy. Some of you may have to go right back to do some port operations, so please don't go back. Okay, okay, we understand. So thank you for being here today. Okay, um, I just like to acknowledge I saw uh, Mayor uh, Heitzman join us from Georgia, and I don't know if she's talked about. I did see her though, just want to acknowledge her, and then also um, Mayor Potem from the city of Auckland, Carmen Maris, uh, joined us. So it's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, who's going to give us a taste of what's going on in the world of e commerce. Um, I'd like to give him a, a formal introduction here because he comes with so much experience. Jay Tao is a serial entrepreneur who has led several companies in the technology, CPG manufacturing, international trade and distribution finance and real estate industries. He started his career working for Arthur Anderson and Company as a tax and business associate 
and later co-founded Sapien Consulting LLC, an information technology consulting firm focused on next generation internet ERP applications and network infrastructure for the financial services and manufacturing industries. Since his technology background focused on the financial vertical industry, he later transitioned to serve executive and leadership roles at investment companies and later became the founding managing director of TMG Capital West and Ameritrust Asset and Capital Management LLC, private equity real estate investment firms, where he managed and funded close to four billion in transactions. Mr. Tao was a partner and board member of Skepter Corporation and Bridge Arc Trading, leading international and trading and distribution conglomerates that represent and distribute industry renowned and brand recognized products throughout the world. There he built several of the company's e-commerce platforms and managed supply chain partners from raw material sourcing, OEM private label development, pre-post production oversight, logistic strategies, and custom clearance. He led and managed research and development, product conceptualization, and sales teams to establish a global product distribution, distribution network spanning five continents. He's currently the founder and CEO of Globemark Technology, a global B2E e e-commerce marketplace startup utilizing innovative media and, what do you say here, SAAS or SAS technology, he'll tell us, to facilitate and commerce transactions and make trade between SMEs easier around the world. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Jay Tom. Come on. All right, thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Porter Fornini, for having me. Um, honored to be in this room with great, uh, highly esteemed individuals. So today we're gonna to talk about, we're gonna talk about trade and e-commerce and the trends and phenomenon driving global e-commerce. Now, Kristen told me I have half an hour to talk about this topic, which I can go on for days. So I'm going to cram as much information as possible and give you hopefully some great valuable insight and takeaways um, for you and your organization. So let's get two of the most boring thing out of this presentation out of the way. Number one is me. So I'm Jay Chow. Um, Kristen was nice enough to, to talk about my background. Done a lot in supply chain, a lot in e-commerce, a lot in technology. Um, directed you know, several e-commerce and distribution business units for various companies, worked with brands large and small, Nestle, Hershey, um, you name it, to you know, emerging product companies like The Honest Company and, and Seventh Generation. I'm an advisor, business advisor for SBDC and the EDC, um, also in Shanghai and the LA Chamber of Commerce, and I'm a venture advisor for a lot of technology companies and global incubators like Techstars, Founder Institute, Google Ventures, and, and Pixel Exchange in LA. So the next morning thing is talk about some stats. So B2C e-commerce sales worldwide. Obviously, we've come a long way. Um, next year is projected to be $2.3 billion, uh, trillion dollars, actually, in sales worldwide. Um, let's look at some, country, some countries kind of leading the way, United States, China, United Kingdom. Cross-border B2C obviously is, is led by um, European nations, led by the United States, um, the Nordic nations. We'll talk a lot about cross-border trade. That's going to be a highlight of my conversation with you guys today. Asia Pacific is a leading region for e-commerce sales, uh, representing 33% of total e global e-commerce sales, and trailing that is North America and Western Europe. B2B e-commerce. Forrester is forecasting that e-commerce, uh, B2B e-commerce sales is going to reach uh, $1.1 trillion by the year 2020. And 30% of today's B2B buyers complete at least half of their work purchases online. So intelligence and e-commerce. So I'm going to talk about little snippets of, of, of drivers that are really affecting and, and providing a catalyst to this change in global e-commerce. One of it is intelligence in e-commerce and this demographic that we call millennials. So recent studies turned out young people don't want to talk to, per don't talk to merchants, right? They want to do their shopping through mobile commerce, they want to shop online, uh, they want to get pricing information, pricing intelligent information, shopping comparison, um, they want personal representation, they want personalization. So Ala BMW has talked about 
Um, we want to customize and tailor solutions and products to these young millennials. Adidas, Nike, they're all jumping on the bandwagon to provide customized shoes, customized apparel, customized clothing. And that's what these young millennials, which are the future consumers of the world, are demanding. Big buying days are a huge driver for global e-commerce. So Cyber Monday, Black Fridays, um, Super Saturday. So these are all catapulting tremendous amount of volume in global e-commerce. Who's heard of uh, Alibaba's single day? Raise your hand. So November 11th, what happens November 11th? It's one huge day which Alibaba, through Tmall and Taobao, which we'll talk about a little bit later, has a huge sale in which all of their merchants, all of their vendors, have dramatic discounts and they drive tremendous amount of volume. They've been break, breaking records year after year. I think they did some ridiculous number, $40 billion in one day. We work with an ad company actually that does a lot of prepackaged food, almonds, dry berries, and they did $200 million in sales in one day. One day through Alibaba's um, uh, single sale. So, that's a huge phenomenon. E-commerce platforms, Magento, Shopify, Big Commerce, these are all what we call hosted shopping cart solutions. We work with all of these product, uh, all of these platforms for our company. We help a lot of brands sell on these platforms. So a small, medium-sized merchant factory brand can easily hop on this platform, pay $30 a month, and instantly build within hours or days an e-commerce storefront and start selling consumers online. So, this has definitely propelled the growth of e-commerce. So we're gonna look at some e-commerce trends. One is global growth. Logistic choices, we're gonna talk about CBT, this phenomenon called uh, uh, CBT, which is cross-border trade, um, and global sh uh, drop shipping. Shipping behavior, subscription curation services, tailored services in e-commerce, huge marketplaces, and how mobile, social, and payments and, and technology are affecting consumer behavior especially when it comes to global e-commerce. So back in 2000, most of the internet users came from developed economies, right? Two thirds came from the Western Hemisphere, North America, Europe, etc. Japan, Korea taking about 20%, and a sprinkling here and there with other countries in Latin, in China, Southeast Asia. As did the traffic on the Alexa top 20. Alexa ranks these websites, and back then the top 10 websites were mainly from the United States. MSN, this was before Google's time. Yahoo, AOL, a few South Korean and Japanese companies. Today, the situation is quite different. Internet penetration near saturation in developed economies. So the opportunity lies in emerging countries. And the traffic from fast growing economies, such as China, India, Russia, make up half of the top Alexa top 20. So you have Baidu, which is China's Google, QQ, Taobao, the largest marketplace in the world, Sina China, Weibo, Yandex. These are all growing in mass popularity. 83% of Thai internet users use Facebook. So here's, a, here's an image of uh, a global uh, a street vendor that is managing her own website through her mobile device. There's a, mobile, a motorcycle taxi that shepherds and moves product all around town doing same day deliveries at pennies. And so these services offer great experiences but are good enough and offer great balance to reach effort, functionality, and adaptability of the local, of local circumstances. And most of these pages you see the large growth out in the countryside where the population is largely underserved by other retailers as well as brick and mortar shops. But reaching the underserved doesn't merely apply to large rural populations. China has 14 cities with populations over 5 million. We do a tremendous amount of business in China. I have several offices in China, and so that's obviously one area that we really have a strong student focus on. Southeast Asia, Latin America, these are all areas that we work in. A whopping 41 cities with more than 2 million inhabitants. Dense. And a middle class growing at a rate of 80,000 people a day. Fastest growing middle class. The second fastest is Southeast Asia, right? Plus your countries. Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore. Reaching China's 600 million rural residents can be hard. But opening enough stores to reach 700 million urban residents is even harder. and can be outrageously expensive. So many Chinese 
shopping online isn't so much an electronic version of commerce, it is commerce, right? Pure and simple. This is the form of commerce that they're used to. And using mobile devices isn't just a modern alternative to PC or the computer, it's the primary and sometimes only means for them to use the internet. So you hear, you see millennials, you see older people, their eyeballs are glued to their mobile devices. More than a fifth of the world's internet users are Chinese. 688 million internet users in China. One point, almost 1.3 billion mobile users in China. Captive audience. China's e-commerce is also different in, very, in one very important way. 70, in the United States, 76% of online retail involves individual merchants. We go to a retailer, we buy something online from Shiseido, from, uh, from you know, wherever it is online, from Macy's. 90% in China, online retail is sold through online marketplaces. So it's a modern, virtual version of this night market, right? Public night markets, town centers, giants, you know, China's giant virtual marketplace enable buyers and sellers to meet each other. And so everything's brought online. The largest marketplace in China is Tmall, owned by Alibaba. With more than 180 million customers, Tmall contains products from more than 150,000 merchants, 200,000 well-known brands. Tmall charges an entry fee, but it provides high visibility <coughs> traffic to the brands, mobile, media optimized. For major brands such as Apple, hosting a virtual storefront in Tmall is a great alternative, sometimes better alternative, than opening thousands of brick and mortar stores. Alibaba also offers a C2C solution, and that is uh, what they call Taobao, which is similar to what we know as eBay, which enables consumers and small merchants to sell to hundreds of millions of people. It's a mix of Amazon and eBay and PayPal with a dash of Google, all wrapped in one. And yes, this family of sites enables consumers to shop for a, a wide range of products that might otherwise be unavailable in the regions. Yes, Tmall can sell a Peugeot, it can sell a Lamborghini. We do a lot, one of our partners is OCJ, which is online um, TV home shopping network. They do a tremendous amount of volume online and on the internet. And they sell things from that evening's dinner item, fresh chicken breast, fresh broccoli, spinach, all the way to the other side of the spectrum. They'll pull up BMWs and Porsches and people are dialing for dollars buying on TV and online. So it's a wild west out there. Retail e-commerce in China, it grew from four, almost five, $500 billion in 2014. Now it's gonna reach $1.6 trillion by next year. In 2019, in a couple years, one out of every China's retail dollars are gonna be spent online. The highest in the world. In the US is about 10% or so. China is going to be close to 34%. What products are they buying? Well, number one tends to be fashion, apparel. Women drive consumer, uh, consumer purchasing behavior. So apparel is a very, very big category. But we work a lot with fresh food in the ad community. We work a lot with prepackaged consumer products, consumer electronics, baby products. These are all emerging categories that are hugely high in demand. Lifestyle-based products, very, very much high in demand. So the Chinese marketplace model has already slipped beyond its borders. Jumia, the largest online shopping mall in Africa. Most people don't have phones, but there, there are only three malls per 200 million inhabitants. It's a unique time and a great opportunity to leapfrog online. Tons of marketplaces. We have Amazon China, you have KG Port, you have Dangdang. You have Suning, VIP Global, you have Yihao Dian. The world's largest e-commerce sites, Amazon and, and Alibaba, in the next three years will make up 39% of the global online retail space. The largest right now is Taobao, which is Alibaba's B2C uh, internet portal. 600, uh, 601 million unique visitors on, on a monthly basis. Amazon's next, followed by eBay, Alibaba, Alipay. Rakuten is one of the largest in Japan. Flipkart and right now is growing vastly. It's one of the largest marketplaces. It actually is the largest marketplace in India. So what's propelling all this, and what's, what's going to happen next? Well, cross-border trade, CBT, we believe, is really the next wave to global e-commerce. And why is that compelling? Well, traditional international trade requires a merchant, a factory, a brand, to work with distributors, work with a, tr a trading company. 
and they'll sell through the value chain that's extended. They'll sell through the supply chain and sell to other distributors in local countries and sell these products. And then ultimately sell to retailers who end up put the, putting the product in the consumer's hands. Well, in the CBT model, you have these vast marketplaces that have attracted millions and millions and millions of traffic. And what do they want to do? They want to sell products. They sell products on an international scale, and it allows international distributors, factories, Chiquita, BMW, you name it, brands, to sell on these platforms and drop ship directly to their customers. Mature supply chain networks, mature logistics, mature consolidated shipping have allowed companies to be able to sell directly to these marketplace customers at a fraction of the cost. What are the, why do they want that? Why do consumers around the world want these type of products, want these lifestyle products? One, because they believe it's high quality. Right? A lot of these countries have internal scandals with their manufacturing, um, issues with, with uh, product development. They want brand. right? They want the Oreo cookie. They want spam. They want these things that we're all accustomed to and never buy, but they want it. <laughs> they want hard to get products. They want product variety, right? So that's what they want. Common logistics models, three ways, <coughs> direct shipping. So it's a direct drop ship. I put products on Tmall, someone buys it on Tmall, I ship directly to the customer, okay? Sounds easier than it is, but ultimately there are some nuances to the game. That shipping is when a merchant, a product, a factory, a product company, can ship to a cross-border distribution center in batches, and then it's shipped into China. And then the third is bonded warehouses. So there's bonded warehouses set up in a lot of free trade zones around the world. South Africa, Australia, um, Brazil, China, Korea, et cetera. And orders are fulfilled directly within their local region. Direct shipping is great because a lot of these companies and marketplaces no longer want to care have carrying costs or inventory costs. Right? Everyone wants just-in-time fulfillment these days. So it's a little bit more expensive because someone in China or Korea has to buy a product and wait for the product to come from the United States. So it could take anywhere between, we've seen that come down about three to five to six days, uh, but there's no inventory cost. So people in the supply chain, people in the value chain, distributors and, and, and retailers don't have to worry about carrying inventory. Batch shipping, I talked about that using distribution centers and bonded service is a much cheaper option, but there is some, carry, some, some carrying costs and inventory risk. So small brands will take their products and inventory into a bonded warehouse, let's say in China and Hong Kong in a free trade zone, and then from there is directly shipped. So it can be same day, it could be two or three days. It's much cheaper and quicker. Tmall is a huge, it's obviously I talked about the Alibaba, it's a huge marketplace, and they've launched Tmall Global. Tmall Global is focused direct, strictly on CBT direct, direct dropship. So they work with brands such as Kraft and, um, and Hershey and you know, Nutella and Starbucks. And they, these companies here in the United States can post products onto their platform, they sell it and do a direct dropship model. JD, Jingdong Worldwide. JD is the second largest platform in China and they've launched JD Worldwide. Um, JD is a huge company. They're publicly traded on NASDAQ here. And they've also launched a CBT initiatives in which product companies and brands can put their, post their products and then directly drop ship to customers. So delivery. Delivery is another driver of this global e-commerce phenomenon. You have Amazon stating, you know, uh, building same-day delivery platforms. You have crowdsourced delivery platforms in which you have, you know, leveraging the gig economy such as Uber, all providing parcel shipments same-day shipments, and these are going well beyond the capabilities of what FedEx and UPS are doing. Um, they're disrupting a lot of their models. And so FedEx and, 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 uh, and UPS are actually funding a lot of these companies um, and incorporating them through corporate development to, to help innovate their own uh, last mile delivery. Jack Ma from Alibaba um, has spent billions of dollars trying to fulfill one promise to China, and that is to be able to offer same-day shipping to every single corner in China, whether it's metrop metropolitan areas in Beijing to in Shanghai to the Hubei province or um, you know, Hanmei province down in eastern China, in, in western China. Huge initiative. Tmall, Taobao also account for one half of all the deliveries in China. So it shows you, in terms of courier deliveries, where these 
products and orders are coming from. They're coming from e-commerce. Logistic choices. You have speed is really important for consumers. They used to say that speed was the fourth important factor. I would say right now it's probably the, 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 the number one or number two factor outside of price. <clears throat> social commerce. Who likes who's on social media? Don't be afraid of it. So social media is driving this e-commerce phenomenon. You have Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, um, Instagram. Pinterest, Yelp, they're all getting to the e-commerce game. They're all enabling their customers to socially share, discuss, talk, build communities around product, and then enable product purchases. China also loves e-commerce. There's thousands of e-commerce networks in China. But the most popular social media in China is not just a website, it's actually a platform. WeChat, who's on WeChat? Who has WeChat? Okay, if you don't have WeChat, download this. Right away. One of the most popular is WeChat. And they have, in, in three years of their existence, when they first started, they, uh, they were able to amass 500 million users. 500 million users. The VP of Xiaomi said, literally every single person I know, everyone I met in China is on WeChat. I don't use email. I don't use the phone. I don't use chat. I don't use SMS. I only use WeChat. So WeChat is not only a social platform to do texting, but it's a platform to do payments, mobile payments, um, e-commerce, microblogging, subscription services, where you get your news all on your phone. So their, their API is extensive. Brands are creating mini sites on WeChat strictly. Um, there's full-blown transactions happening on WeChat, all on the mobile device. Since we're talking about mobile, what's really propelling all of this is payments and payment technology. So mobile phone payments currently make up 20% of Starbucks transactions, right? Apple expects Apple Pay um, to, 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 to grow. Digital currencies such as Bitcoin is changing the name of the game. Um, in many countries that we go to, that, that we do business in, people don't carry around credit cards. They don't carry around currencies. Everything is done literally with their mobile phone. If you're looking at fragments of the one web philosophy, you're sadly not going to find it here. Virtual wallets, mobile payments, alternative finance models are quite popular in economies um, as they address a whole host of needs, right? A fourth of the adults in the sub-Saharan African desert have a, have, have, don't have accounts. Only, ha only a fourth of them have formal accounts in financial institutions. Less than 15% of Indonesians have a credit card. <laughs> but they're driving tremendous amount of sales through mobile. In countries such as Kenya, India, Philippines, entire virtual banks such as M-Pesa enable customers to send and receive money, pay for goods online and offline. Countries in China, Nigeria, Indonesia, you can pay for goods with or without currency through online purchases. And with so much e-commerce taking place in giant marketplaces, what about the fear of counterfeit goods? So Alibaba created Alipay. Alipay was created to, tr to, to, to really increase trust and, create a, and, a, and provide a platform in which offers as an escrow service to release payment once goods have received. So Alipay is very similar to PayPal. But more than 800 million registered users use Alipay. And it's so common, you can pay for everything, for child's tuition, utility bills, whatever it is. Everyone is on Alipay. <coughs> in Korea, they use T-Money. 71 million of these virtual tech cards are being used for 50 million people around the, around the country to make purchases. Octopus is used in Hong Kong, 20 million cards in circulation. So decades old mobile technology is now migra migrating progressively towards these relevant type of payment methods. These brands, consumers, are merely leapfrogging desktop, leapfrogging finance, leapfrogging physical retail, right? They inhabit a giant, rapid prototype of our future. Alipay, a few years ago, had $150 billion in transactions, just in that year. PayPal only had $25 billion. Just this year, they surpassed <coughs> $400 billion in transactions. Mobile commerce, this, this extends itself to mobile commerce. So, Everything's done on mobile, right? Mobile transactions are expected 
to climb to one, $142 billion next year, according to, to Forrester. The share of online to mobile shopping experience. Back in 2011, mobile was a fraction of online shopping. But ne by next year, it's going to surpass online shopping on desktop and retail shopping. Mobile activities. Where we're seeing growth, everywhere. Holiday shopping, one in four orders was through mobile. People looking for mobile couponing, 40% seek mobile couponing. 65% um, get all of their marketing emails through mobile. 51% use mobile purchases through their smartphone. Skip that a second. A future inhabited by people for whom the words offline, online, and mobile have become irrelevant. The little baggage to weigh, dead, to weigh them down, they can't ignore what's normal and turn constraints into opportunities. The cool thing about prototypes is that they're allowed to be a little bit crazy. So Russian e-commerce brand Lamada has turned poor postal infrastructure into an excuse to do something different. So Lamada sends sales agents directly to consumers. Right? They have uniformed men bringing clothes. They, they custom tailor it. They take returns. They process the payments right there on the spot. Right? In Korea, this is a crazy phenomenon happening. Grocery stores are embedded on subway platforms. Right, projected on the sub subway screens, <laughs> where QR codes are scanned and people waiting for the subway literally scan their items. By the time they get home, they have everything in their doorstep. They have fresh chicken, lettuce, they have milk right there in there. So people are in the subway, they don't need to go to the grocery store. The grocery store is projected on the walls as they wait for the subway. In China, online grocery stores, Yihao Dian, launched a, a thousand virtual retail branches or kiosks in one day, cleverly positioning them all around the city to drive purchase activity. Meanwhile, in Africa, why build expensive roads in remote, remote rural locations when drones do the job just as well? So they're investing billions of dollars in drone technology and curtailing traditional transportation infrastructure. Combine drones, Lamada's upselling at your doorstep, and things could get really interesting. <coughs> the rise of global, of mobile, and internet have changed our world beyond recognition. No one can predict what will happen next. What we do know is that the future, in the future, the opportunities will be much more global than they've ever been to meet today's challenges and compete in this giant marketplace. So that's the global landscape of e-commerce. And a lot of brands are trying to traverse this complicated myriad of opportunities that exist for them to really syndicate themselves and create exposure. So just a little plug, what we do, Glowmark, is we created a platform to really sell and create exposure to brands. Again, we work with big brands, Nestle, Hershey, to Procter & Gamble, to Johnson & Johnson, to small emerging brands. And what we do is we create a, whole, a retail and a wholesale platform to leverage the power of innovative distribution. We help product brands who are selling on Shopify, who are help selling on Volusion, who are selling on um, Presto Shop and, and WordPress to basically create product data feeds, provide transactions, third-party transactions directly into these micro-distribution marketplaces so that a brand can feel comfortable selling it to Tmall or selling it to Taobao or selling it to Gmarket in Korea or selling it to Coupon super easy. We have a platform that we have pick, pack, and ship facilities in which these brands, all they do, if, you, if you're able to sell to someone in San Diego and, and, and San Francisco through Amazon or through eBay, you can sell to someone in Tanzania. You can sell to someone in New Zealand. You can sell to someone in Seoul, Korea. Exceptionally easy. So we work with a lot of global brands, Kraft, Kellogg's, Cliff Bar, um, Neutrogena, Nature's Way. We have relationships with these brands and we help propel them. And we, we, we help brands who sell into Amazon and Walmart, sell into Tmall. We help brands who are selling into Kroger, Costco, Walmart, Target, Express Buy, <laughs> sell into Taiwan. We help those who are selling to eBay and Etsy sell into various different global platforms. We don't sell, we don't work with all these platforms, but we have strike, we, we have relationships with many of these, Price Minister in France, Sinova in Brazil, Mercado Libre in, in Argentina, um, Deals Direct in Australia. So we help brands, again, reach the global audience when naturally they themselves can't do it because they don't have the resources to have manpower to do product translations, to provide customer service and logistics and tracking. 
So what should e-commerce startups do? Find niches that are underserved. Examine the business case. Do some test marketing. Launch your selling and ramp marketing. That's it for me. Thank you. I appreciate the time that you've given. Uh, here's my contact information. I open it up for any Q&A. Questions? studies, what are you seeing, what are they developing in terms of security? Absolutely. So that's obviously a big, big concern, especially with the older generation that's that, that have been using currency to buy things for, for many, many years. So all of these companies are investing, obviously, billions of dollars in preventing cybercrime, in um, auth authentication technology. Um, in China, in Indonesia, we're seeing in Latin America, a lot of these companies are leveraging their relationships with big banks and insurance companies and providing tremendous amount of um, insurance behind potential identity theft. Um, and these type of assurances are making younger generations like millennials more, more apt. At, at, at using kind of these technologies. So I think as authentication, as security technology improves, uh, and less of these activities happen, um, I think it's, it, start, it starts to become less of a concern. But um, it's a cat and mouse game, right? So um, as technologies are erected and built to prevent you know, hackers and people to steal information, these hackers and, and identity theft individuals and um, find new ways to, to, to create additional programming algorithms to take. So it's a cat and mouse game. We're constantly chasing the buck. But um, I think having insurance companies, having big banks, ensuring consumers that, hey, if there's uh, invalid, you know, charges on your account, we'll immediately, you know, remedy those type of accounts. I think it makes people a little bit more so hopefully another quick one, if yes, I may. Um, so I work for an elected official. I'm an elected official in my hometown. Um, so I'm curious about like the sales tax portion of this. I mean, I'm really happy for all these companies making all this money, but what about you know the revenues to the cities and how does that how does that impact when you have this global e market and where's its tax base and where the revenues come from? If we have this big company, let's say in Santa Paula, my hometown, is that there? Um, origin of sales or, you know, because it, it really <coughs> makes me a little nervous about that portion of it without a good understanding. Can you help me in a minute or two understand that piece? Sure. You know, I think a lot of municipalities, a lot of local government are you know, trying to figure this thing out because, you know, frankly, they want they want their hand in the cookie jar as well. And when, when with the CBT model, um, there are different types of taxation techniques that the countries are doing on a federal level to ensure that um, you know when it comes to duties, when it comes to tax, that they're you know getting kind of a, a, a fair share of their portion. But yeah, I think it's a great question from a from a municipal level, from a local government level, um, and a sales tax level. Um, big companies like you know eBay and, and Amazon have been fighting tooth and nail to um, try to try to escape any potential sales tax. And um, or franchise tax or things of that nature, local business tax. Uh, and I think it's, uh, I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's, uh, it, it's something that is, is top of mind for local officials. And uh, I don't know where that's going to go, but I, I do think that um, there are going to be more and more, um, you know, regulations and, and, and kind of legal, uh, you know, legal regulations that come into place with that. Uh, but I think a lot of companies, I think a lot of local government are kind of brushing this topic kind of under the doormat because they want their companies, number one, to stay there, number two, to thrive. And a lot of these companies are thriving only because they're doing global sales. 
other, they wouldn't be able to survive otherwise. So I think a lot of local governments are saying, you know, well, we'll defer that for now until we can find a solution. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. Yeah. You talk about uh, drop shipping, and what about all the regulatory hurdles that otherwise the traditional, the traditional ways of doing business encounter? Great question. So the reason why a lot of these platforms are moved to drop shipping is because governments in China, governments in Singapore, in, J in, in, in Japan, and Korea have basically said that if you're going to do drop shipping model and you're doing single parcel entry into our country, number one, we don't have the manpower to look at every to do to, to spot check every single product that comes in, right? Um, and so they've really, really. Uh, uh, been flexible on, on duties and tax when it comes to allowing certain type of products and collecting duties and tax compared to traditional international trade. So if you're doing uh, a wholesale transaction, and you're moving you know a container load of product or an, uh, an LCL container load of product into the into into any country, you have customs, you have to custom clearance, you have to pay duties and tax, you have to do CIT. There's VAT tax above that. There's all these type of things. But when it comes to drop shipping. Um, they have lowered the bar. They have lowered the bar, and they've said that individual parcels, individual process orders, let's say under two hundred fifty dollars that come in, they're going to flow through the system. Does that mean that phytosanitary and other things that would go to food, etc., are going to be waived? Yeah, yeah. We move a lot of product through CBT and phytos and and uh, and through through um, through global dropship and no phytos. No certificates of analysis, no you know department of no COOs. I mean, these are just single parcels, and they just kind of let them right into the right, right into the right into the country. So you can go to Tmall, you can go to Taobao, you can see GNC vitamins. You can see products traditionally would have a very difficult time entering the country. Supplements, nutraceuticals, right? Some sort of some ag and food products, but you're seeing them being sold left and right because of of, of CBD. So how does the consumer get protected from unverified uh, products that are, well, that are not necessarily food safe or cosmetic safe or a toy, let's say, that's not safe for their child? How does a consumer who buys a product get protected? In essence, no. In essence, no. So they have to kind of believe and trust the brand. Um, if there are pushback from consumers, um, consumer product review in these countries is a, is a major driver for brands and, and a driver of their success. So consumers go on product reviews and read reviews from consumers. If consumers are saying bad things or saying this is not a trustworthy merchant, this is not a trustworthy brand, then um, you know, the economics will dictate it. People won't buy the product. Yes, ma'am. Fascinating presentation. Thank you so much for that. Um, just one question. Uh, all of this, you know, e-commerce and trade and the volume of the growing marketplace and just curious of the ideas about sustainability, social equity, and our, you know, GHG emissions and global climate change and all of that stuff. I'm just curious to see where that fits into this whole picture. I think this is very, again, it's, it's, it's going to be managed by that invisible hand, right, in the economy. The market's going to dictate products that do well, and the consumers who gravitate to certain type of products that have certain causes and social causes, um, they're going to let it play out in, 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 in the economy. So I'll give an example. Um, we brought seventh generation into China. So seventh generation is the, the largest natural cleaning product in the United States. They make toiletries, they make, you know, window cleaners and kitchen cleaners and all of these type of things. And, and their whole MO and their whole value proposition is we make all of our cleaning products with plant enzymes because it's non-toxic, it doesn't have any toxic fumes, and it's safe for the household and children. They've done exceptionally well. Um, so you have Thai, you have Procter & Gamble, all mimicking their marketing um, type style. But when we took it to China, they failed miserably because the Chinese consumers didn't care about their value proposition, right? It turned out that um, seventh generation thought that they can take a very cookie cutter approach in terms of figuring out what worked in this country, take it to another vast market, and it's gonna dramatically excel, and it didn't. 
Why? Because the consumer, they didn't understand the consumers, and the consumers in China didn't gravitate to that. What we, what we found out was when they buy a cleaning product, they want to make sure, number one, that it's a very good cleaning product. It cleans germs, it disinfects, whatever. And then all of that other stuff is secondary. It's peripheral, right? It's not toxic, that's great, that's touchy-feely, but they don't drive their consuming behavior based on that. So we had to do major branding changes and say, this, is, this cleans just as well as your local cleaners. This cleans just as well as bleach or ammonia, whatever it is. And on top of that, it happens to be safe for the environment. It happens to be non-toxic. And so after a rebrand, um, you know, they, they, they started to get some traction. So going to your point, it, I think the consumers in, the, in those markets will dictate. In China and Korea, they're heavily focused right now on health. Um, and they're super health conscious. Um, and so they're, they're looking to purchase products that are non-GMO. They're looking to purchase products that are organic and natural. Um, they're looking uh, for, for products that um, are, are eco-friendly and biodegradable and safe for the environment. So I think to your question, the consumers will, will, will dictate the pace of how, um, you know, the traction and the scale that the brands ultimately come, come away with. Our theme of e-commerce, our, our next speaker with us today is Julianne Hennessy. She's a, a director of the U.S. Department of Commerce in the Los Angeles West Office, and she's with the export promotion arm of the, um, of the department. Ms. Hennessy assists small to medium-sized businesses to reach their exporting potential by identifying key export markets developing and implementing market strategies, and providing information on regulations and import requirements in markets around the world. Her portfolio includes the apparel, cosmetics, franchising, healthcare technologies, and travel and tourism sectors. She regularly collaborates with a wide range of trade promotion partners throughout Los Angeles to organize outreach and educational events on exporting. She's a frequent speaker on commercial service programs and services and how companies can take advantage of them to grow their international business. Ms. Hennessy was honored to be recognized by Women in International Trade Los Angeles as Outstanding Woman of the Year in International Trade in 2014. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Julianne Hennessy. presentation was so good, you'll be a hard act to follow, but I'm <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm Julianne Hennessy, as Kristen said, and Kristen, thank you very much for the invitation to come join you today, and to Donna, and to everybody at Port Wanini. It's a pleasure to see such a, a big group here to talk about, or to listen about e-commerce. Um, and I'd like to just take a minute to introduce my colleague, Jerry Vaughn, who is here, who sits here at the Port of Wanini. So he is the director of this office and of course covers Ventura County and beyond. I have my two colleagues that are here with me from West Los Angeles. Cynthia Torres, who can raise her hand because she's also focusing on e-commerce, so she'll be a great, uh, great contact for you. And Eric Olson, who is a commercial officer. Uh, he's here in my office for a year, and he leaves in September, and he will go on to Monterey, Mexico. But he has come from South Korea, from Recife, Brazil. He opened the office in Angola, Africa. So he has quite a bit of experience as well. So uh, we're here, we're here from the government, and we're here to, to talk with you about what we are doing in the e-commerce space. But let me just take a minute now and uh, move my slide here. There we go. Just, if you are not familiar with the commercial service, if you'll just allow me to just, just indulge me for a minute to give you a brief overview of what we do. And as I said, we are the federal government. We are the export promotion arm of the U.S. Department of Commerce. So our sole reason for being is to assist businesses to grow their business in international markets and to advocate for U.S. businesses abroad. And we also, of course, promote inbound investment to the United States because obviously our job is to help businesses grow, to help employ more Americans, and so our goal is, or our job is really economic development. And we do that through a variety of ways, but mostly through our network of, of offices. Did I just go down? I'm sorry. There we go. Our offices here in the United States and around the world. 
So I'm from Los Angeles, from West Los Angeles. We also have an office in downtown Los Angeles. Of course, Jerry Vaughn is here in Ventura. We go all the way up the coast, all the way up to San Francisco, down to San Diego, and around the world. Of course, the United States and around the world. And Eric is an example. He came from Recife, uh, Brazil, from Seoul, Korea. And of course, he will go on to our US consulate in, in, in Monterey, Mexico. The goal of all this is to be on the ground, to be here, to be present, and to work with companies to help them understand international markets. And so with those of us on the ground locally to come out, to meet with you, to talk with you, we can connect you to our colleagues also in markets around the world at the US and the US consulates to help you understand how to do business internationally and how to do businesses in markets around the world. So as I said, we are here throughout the United States and we are around the world in the major commercial centers around the world. And some of the, the areas that, of course, we focus on are, are traditionally how to help companies understand about exporting. In other words, what do you need to do to sell into markets? What do you need to do to your product, to your packaging? What regulations do you need to understand? To sell, and Jay, you were mentioning that there are many, many regulations that companies have to overcome to address and to be able to sell their markets. We can do all that through one of our first, our first main areas of, of assistance is trade counseling. And we will connect with you, we will come out and meet with you, and between those of us on the ground here and our colleagues around the world, we can provide you with information to help you understand how to sell your product in a particular market. And obviously, every product is unique, every sector is unique, every company is unique. And so you all have your own goal, goals and objectives of what you're trying to do. And we try to help you understand how your objectives can fit into that particular market. But as Jay was saying, it's understanding the competition, it's understanding how things are changing, what you need to do to be competitive in that market. And of course, we always say if you're competitive here in the US, you can pretty much be competitive in markets around the world because we are an extremely competitive market and obviously one of the most open markets in the world. So you're already competing if you can sell your, you sell your products here. So trade counseling, that's one of the first areas that we work, that we, that we, um, is an area of expertise for us because we will obviously connect you with specialists in our office, trade specialists in our office who focus on particular industry sectors. I myself, I've covered the healthcare technology sector for many, many years. I've covered the franchising sector. We cover cosmetics. Cynthia covers renewable energies. So we have quite a bit, and focusing on e-commerce now, Eric, being an officer, has worked with many, many different different sectors, um, having them get into different markets, the markets where he's been present. So we focus by sector. We try to understand what it takes to sell your particular product in that, area, in that sector in a market, and that all falls under our, our trade counseling rubric, I want to say here. Now, market intelligence. That is also an area where companies come to us and say one of the biggest challenges they have is, of course, understanding the market. And because we have the presence in international markets, we are literally an email or phone call away from helping companies understand what it takes to sell into a market, whether it's regulatory requirements, whether it's, it's labeling requirements, whatever type of, of standards, whatever type of technical requirements, we can help you understand what you need to know to sell your product into that market. And that's a big area for us with market intelligence. Who are your competitors? How are they selling? Where are they selling? And obviously, as Jay's saying, so many companies are selling online now. But what are the channels of distribution? What are the different different ways that you get your products? What are the social media sites? These are all the types of things that we can help you try to understand as you look at different markets and look to, look to, uh, to, to new opportunities around the world. And of course, business matchmaking, that is one of my favorite areas because we, it is an area of expertise for us. We, of course, technology has allowed us to get better and better at it because the more information we can have about you, the buyer, excuse me, you, the exporter, you, the seller, and information about the buyer in a foreign market, we can put the two of you together. And we have a variety of programs and services that help us do that for you, and I'll have a slide right a few after this, so just give a brief overview of our of the services that we can offer in that way. 
but it's a great way for us to put you in front of, a great, a great opportunity for us to put you in front of potential buyers for your products. Now, of course, there's a whole different realm, as Jay was saying, and of course, that's why you're all here today in terms of the e-commerce space. So let me just jump ahead and just speak a little bit now about what we're doing in the e-commerce space. And obviously recognizing that this is a huge opportunity for companies and a huge area for companies to not only seize the opportunities, but because I work for the government and because we're here to help you as a business, we also want you to be very mindful of the things that you need to know about selling into the e-commerce space. And so we have worked very diligently to, to understand opportunities for businesses, but also to help them understand and to train, to train companies about what they need to know to be able to be on these e-commerce platforms. And Jay, you were mentioning that this singles day. And so just as a small company, would you have the wherewithal to be able to do $200 million of sales in a day, right? So as a small company, and I bet for all of you, I wish you all the luck and hope it will help you get there. But to start off, you have to start off step by step to be able to move in that direction. And so this is the type of thing that we're trying to help companies understand. We have developed what is called the, the e-commerce innovation lab. And this is now an area where we are focusing a lot of our attention. Cynthia has been very much involved with this, working very closely with the direction with the direct the director of that office, Josh Halpern, and developing training modules, developing partnerships, developed with, with key e-commerce service providers, developing or trainers, that type of a thing. <coughs> to better provide, infor or to provide information to help companies move forward and to help companies understand the realm of e-commerce. And so I just put this up here just because I, I didn't want to, I, I only had so much time, and of course, as Jay said, we could spend a whole week talking about e-commerce. But I just wanted to, to point out to you the types of topics that if you go to export.gov, which, by the way, is the government's, the US government's export portal. So if you're just trying to find information about exporting in general, you could go to export.gov and click on our country commercial guides, which are market research reports, which, which talk about markets in, in markets around the world and how to sell to them. You can pull up industry sector reports, team, or we have global teams which focus on regions and industry sectors, you can pull up market research on that. So there's a plethora of information available on export.gov, logistics, uh, legal requirements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But one of the areas, of course, now is export.gov e-commerce. And you can literally click on each one of these topics, and this is just the beginning of the topics, and as Jay was indicating, there is so much to understand and to, and to be aware of about e-commerce. But you can click on each one of those topics and not only read a little bit about what we would like to, to, to let you know about those areas, but also an additional list of resources, whether it's videos, whether it's additional clicks to get to another reference. But it's all geared toward you as a small business to help you understand, or I'm sorry, let me say this business, but of course our, our goal is obviously to work with small and medium-sized businesses to help them grow. But um, you can click on all these different topics to help you understand different facets of e-commerce. And you, as I said, you can get to videos and you can move down the list, and it will provide you with a great resource to help you move along into the e-commerce channels. So this is one thing I wanted to, to point out. So you hear about the great work and, and obviously what's being done in the e-commerce space and the, the, the different malls and the different marketplaces. But we just want you to be aware of to protect your intellectual property. So if you have a brand, you need to make sure that's protected before you ever go onto a site. And you can click on protecting your intellectual property and it will tell you the steps to take and what you need to be aware of to protect your intellectual property. And this is something as the commercial service, as the Department of Commerce, we take very seriously. The US, and US Patents and Trademarks Office is part of the Department of Commerce. And so we take it very seriously and we do not want our companies to be selling their products overseas if it has not been adequately protected. 
So as you remember, it's just challenges with, with counterfeit and with trademarks, and you just want to make sure that you that you have taken the steps necessary to protect that. So just some of the key points that I want you to be aware of. And another initiative that we um, that well, through the e-commerce innovation lab is another reference for you called gettingtoglobal.com. And this is another website that, that, that has been created through the e-commerce innovation lab. To it, and it will be a, pri a public private sector website which will bring together the resources that can help companies to expand their businesses to e-commerce. And, and through that website, please check it out, gettingtoglobal.com, there, be there will be webinars and, and training opportunities where you can go month by month and take the different steps of what it takes to become an e-commerce exporter or e-commerce seller. All right. So you can just keep an eye out for that, watch for that, and you can log on and you can listen to these webinars because there will be these public, I am having the hardest time saying that, public-private partnerships, uh, partners who will provide the training for you. Also, we, um, there will be a mission that will be going to China and to India <coughs> focusing on e-commerce. So Cynthia can tell you more about that. She's working on that actively. We have brochures for you here, but if it's something that you're keenly interested in and something that you would like to learn more about, please please stop by and we'll give you our, our, um, our website, or our, our literature for that. Now, just covering the e-commerce space, as I said, there's just so much information that is available to you to help you to better understand the process. So I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Now, moving to, of course, the mix of traditional, whether you're looking for just a distributor or another partner in international markets, traditionally, that is what the commercial service has done. Eric, will, with his colleagues overseas and his staff, he will help companies <coughs> identify distributors, identify key partners, identify contacts at various ministries of health, various ministries to help you understand regulatory requirements, this is the type of thing that we can do to help you in international markets. And I just put up here a variety of programs that we have. Our goal is always about, if possible, and if this is your goal as a company, to put you face to face with potential buyers or key contacts that can help you move <laughs> forward in a particular market. And so I just list up here our partnership programs, our business matchmaking programs, and our trade missions that we are running all the time. And the goal of all that, as I said, is to put you face to face with qualified potential buyers or qualified sources for you to understand how to sell in that market, if it's a ministry official, a government official, so that you can come away with information about selling into that market. So just wanted to make sure that you're away, uh, aware of that by contacting any of us here or by going on to export.gov, depending on where you're located, or speaking with Jerry. Jerry just, Jerry's standing up over there. Speaking with Jerry, we can help you connect and, and, to, and to learn more about these different programs. All right. So with that, I think I'm probably out of my time here. Um, Say one more thing here. Trade shows, I saw Jay on your side that you had the Natural Products Expo West event. We are avid, avid supporters of trade shows. We work actively with local with, with trade show organizers because of the different programs that we can offer in full collaboration with the trade show organizer. We bring in foreign buyers to trade shows, domestic trade shows. We also, when we're overseas, we work with certified trade shows. We will work with the trade show organizer to do our best to try to match international buyers at that trade show with our U.S. exhibitors at that trade show. So as I said, it's always about, um, and this is of course a more traditional means than a, than, a, than a marketplace online, but I just want you to be aware of that throughout, whatever your objectives are as a company, whether it's traditional channels such as trade show or trade missions, whether you're looking for a distributor, but also if you're looking to sell on e-commerce platforms, the information is available to you and the resources are available to you to help you do this. And as a, as a U.S. government official, I also want to say I see one of our district export council members. <laughs> Sorry, David, for you're way in the back. David Abib has been a longtime district export council member of our Southern, Southern, our district export council of Southern California. He has been appointed by the Secretary of Commerce to work with companies 
companies, to council companies in the area of export promotion. And so we have many members like, like David throughout Southern California, but they are a resource for us and also a resource for you, but also the SBDCs, Small Business Development Centers, the Centers for International Trade Development. There are many, many organizations that are there to help businesses understand about exporting. And so I just like to leave you with that message and let you know that we'll be here to talk with you and we have lots of information, additional information to share. So thank you. And Jerry, Jerry Bonds as well. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much and for helping our companies connect to the world. And uh, talking about connecting to the world, um, we're going to hear from the voices around the globe now. We have trade consuls here and, and commissioners that are going to share some of the activities and initiatives going on in, in their parts of the world and how they connect with us here in Ventura County. So very excited to hear from all of them. And what I'll do is I will give you a little background on each one, and then they'll, they'll come up and, and, and give a presentation. So first, we're going to hear from Roberto Rodriguez Hernandez, and he's our Oxnard Consul General of Mexico. He was uh, taken this office on 11, uh, excuse me, July 11th in 2016. He covers the counties of Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Obispo. He is an avid academic. He earned a law degree from the National Autonomous University of Morelos and graduate studies in criminal sciences from the University of Valle Bravo. He has held various positions both in Mexico's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and abroad. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he was an analyst at the Director General Consular Affairs. Um, this was from 1977 to 1978. The Private Secretary of the Undersecretary of Foreign Affairs from 1989 to 1992. Deputy Director General and then Director General of Protection and Consular Affairs, 2001 to 2004. And Director General of Protection of Mexicans Abroad from June 2012 to March 2013. So very happy to have you here with us. He's a true friend. We participate in a lot of events together. I'm so pleased that you could be with us today. You accommodate the microphone after our colleague of the United States. Mm -hmm. It uh, shows us the different sides of the economy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I have seven minutes, I think. Well, I want, I want to try to uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Thank you for the invitation. This is a visionary reunion because we already heard about the future of the economy in a global world. And I have some kind of schizophrenia or maybe uh, bipolar situation because I heard a lot of different politicians talking about we have to establish uh, aranceles, we have to establish uh, taxes. And we see something different here. We are going in different direction because the market is very important and the facts are there. So uh, we would like to start talking about the Mexican economy, but uh, well, we do have different kind of uh, strengths. We do have a lot of different kind of uh, opportunities because our, de our demography, uh, when we hear uh, talking about e-commerce, mobile commerce, Timor, <coughs> well, we do have a huge market because we, we do have a lot of people emerging to the mid middle class. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities for the different companies to establish in Mexico in order to the warehouse in order to distribute the products from any part of the world. And in addition, well, gradually our infrastructure has been changing since uh, NAFTA, the trade of Mexico with the rest of the world is six times more than 
20 years ago. So that, that shows the kind of opportunity that we do have. And obvi obviously, we are an open economy. We hear about the worries about the tax sales from the cities, from the state, even the problems with sustainability, ecological related problems. But at the end, the world is going to be more global and global and global. So we have to be able to be ready to use the new tools, the new technologies to be part of this new era. Uh, instead to think about walls, instead to think about establish different kind of barriers, we must be able to see the future rather than the past. Mexico is not the problem. Mexico is part of the solution because the, uh, the location where with the United States and with Canada, and we are going to be partners. Well, we are partners, but we are going to be partners in this new era. Actually, our good friend of uh, the Consul General of Canada, very active in the whole region. We, we have an encounter, different kind of encounters in Phoenix, talking about that, the importance of the investments of Canada in Mexico, the investment of Canada in Arizona, especially because the location. So uh, the future is there. We must be able to find the proper tools to be ready to participate in this new era. And in fact, um, our, our people from Colombia, or, I'm sorry, from Ecuador, they were talking about they move from Long Beach to Guaynini. We must be able to look different alternatives in order to take advantage of Guaynini. Because you have all the infrastructure, you have all the know-how, and many companies, not just from Mexico and Canada and United States, but a lot of companies should take advantage of Port Guaynini. We know that it's going to be very prosperous for Guaynini, Mayor, mm -hmm. and for Oxnard, we will have here the Vice Mayor, and obviously for, for Ventura. So, um, Mexico is ready to form part, to be ready to participate in this new era. Uh, you can see uh, our location is a good location to receive different kind of products from any part of the world. To be part of the Timor, to be part of uh, uh, e-commerce, to be part of mobile commerce, and complying with the rules. Fortunately, besides those kind, those kind of things related with uh, revising NAFTA, the rules already are there, and we must be able just to accommodate the situations, the rules, to the new circumstances. But the, the, the commerce is going to be open and open and open. Less taxes, more jobs, better consumers. At the end, one of the main objectives, objectives of the global trade is precisely that the consumers might be receiving better products with less <coughs> cost. And it is in the benefit of the economy, local economy, state economy, and the economy for different countries. So we are going to be part of that solution. And in addition, well, we still in the 15 economy. We aspire, we aspire to be the eighth. But well, we need to do our work. We need to do a lot of things. We are facing a lot of challenges, but we do have the people, we do, we do have the infrastructure, and we do have the proper partners up to now. And in addition, we are going to be a new treaty 
to the Pacific, in order to take advantage commercially of China, of China. So uh, obviously we need to do that. And well, I would like to finish talking about the different kind of, of uh, regional trade, but there are a lot of different kind of things that we are not taking advan advantage of it. So we must be able to try to look where is the new, it's, it's not the road, but the new way to be there, to participate with the, with the new commerce from Asia and to try to help Europe. <laughs> uh, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but we are here in order to participate in this new era. Obviously, uh, the most important thing is that we do have NAFTA already. We do have the main rules. NAFTA is covering almost everything. So if we need to adapt to do something else, we are ready to do that. But we are not going to do anything that is going to be affecting our people, our, our sovereignty, or to our partners. So we are ready to negotiate. But well, uh, the representative from the Commerce Department uh, wisely was talking about Intel, Intel Commerce, business planning, match, matchmaking, and different kind of things. We must be worried about not the intel of secrets. We must be worried about intel of the new era, the new trade, the new situation of the world, rather than putting some kind of barriers, putting some kind of new taxes. Because at the end, the only people affected is going to be the consumer. And it reminds me the situation of the city in, at the north who, that used to be the main uh, source of automobiles, Flint. And some um, journalists were comparing, was, com uh, was trying to com compare Flint with Querétaro. Querétaro is producing autos. Flint is not producing autos. Why? Because the market. Uh, I think you said something about the invisible hand. Well, the invisible hand took out the autos from that region. And right now, they are in Querétaro, in Hermosillo, <coughs> different, different places. Why? Because it's the invisible hand of the market. No matter how many laws, no matter how many statements a politician might do, the invisible hand of the market is here in Port Wainimi, Long Beach, and the consumer is the, the best and the most, the most important thing in order to maintain this trend. And your presentation uh, put my ego right there. <laughs> but well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Very inspir inspirational. Um, our next guest is uh, Maria Bellin Lore, and she's with the uh, she's the Ecuador Trade Commission. Uh, she, Consul General Maria Bellin Lore has an extensive background in economics and trade, with a specialization in international trade. She is an economist from the Catholic University of Ecuador, with a master's degree in economics from the University of Oregon, and PhD studies in economics from the University of Lisbon in Portugal. Her past experience include former minister and counselor to the ambassador of Ecuador and Portugal. She's a former economics advisor to the minister of international trade of Ecuador and former trade and investment senior analyst at the trade office of Ecuador in Chicago and current trade commissioner of Ecuador in Los Angeles. So welcome and we look forward to your remarks.
Thank you. You all can see me. <laughs> okay. So, good morning to you all. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Board of Harvard Commissioners, to Christine, um, the CEO and Director of the Port of Lumini, as well as its staff, and to all of our friends from the different institutions that made this event possible, and for letting me, as Trade Commissioner of Ecuador in Los Angeles, to be part of such an important event to acknowledge the role that e-commerce and international trade played to promote the economic development of businesses and societies. I'm going to make a brief presentation about the public and private initiatives of Ecuador to promote international trade partnerships that are more beneficial for all parties involved. So briefly, uh, let me give you some highlights about my talk. So located in South America, Ecuador has an extension similar to the state of Colorado. In a relatively small size country has its, has its advantages. It allows visitors to have breakfast in, in the Amazon jungle, have lunch at an altitude of up to 9,000 feet above the sea level in the highlands, and dinner next to the coast of the Pacific Ocean, all within the same day. Those who visit my country may, may not only enjoy what continental Ecuador has to offer, but also the unmatchable beauty and richness of the Galapagos Islands. Its capital, Quito, was the first city to be declared World Cultural Heritage by UNESCO along with Krakow back in 1978. Though Spanish is our, our official language, English is widely spoken. According to the United Nations, Ecuador is a country of high human development level. Uh, the 2016 GDP amounted to $182 billion, and the US dollar is our currency. We believe that achieving economic growth is not enough, and during the last 10 years, we have worked hard to make Ecuador society more just. In fact, we believe that a fairer society is a prerequisite to achieve a sustainable economic growth. Thus, we have reduced income inequality and have taken around 1.5 million people out of poverty. We have also placed Ecuador among the top four countries in Latin America with the highest human capital level and um, the poverty reduction. From the public sector, we have also improved the factors of production such that during the last eight years, Ecuador has jumped 27 positions in the Global Competitiveness Index. Moreover, we have created ProEcuador, the Institute for Export and Investment Promotion. It has 31 offices all over the world, and four of them are in the US, our most important trade partner. From our trade offices, we promote all the goods that Ecuador has to offer. So it's not just bananas, but plenty of other products. Um, our producers are aware that unless those goods result from responsible social and environmental production practices and high, high, high quality standards, they cannot be competitive in the long run. It has not been an easy task, especially considering that we cannot devaluate our currency. But that has pushed us to diversify products and markets. The high standards of our products, and despite the relatively small size of our country, has made Ecuador the 38th largest provider of goods to the US. We are a top provider of fish and shrimp, bananas and plantains, most, most of which enter the US market precisely through the port of Lenini, flowers called processed tropical fruits and vegetables, and others. However, we believe that in order to sell, a country should be open to buy. And from the US, besides <coughs> mineral fuels, we buy mostly machinery, plastics, animal feed, soybean meal, wheat, and cotton. Even though my role is to promote Ecuadorian export goods, I may tell you that making business with Ecuador by selling your products or investing may be a good choice. Why? Because we allow 100% foreign equity 
ownership without the need for, authori for authorization or prior screening. Moreover, we don't impose any limits on royalties that may be remitted when it comes to license and franchise transactions. Uh, since we use the US dollar, we don't have any foreign exchange issues, and we have been using the US dollar since year 2000. And since 1986, Ecuador has, has, has had an investment warranty agreement with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Ecuador is also a signatory to the Multilateral Investment Warranty Agreement. We also believe that trade agreements may be beneficial for all parties. Even though it took us nine years to reach an agreement with the European Union, we signed it last year, and it's needless to say that signing that agreement made both parties satisfied. We are currently negotiating a agreements with other countries such as South Korea, Turkey, El Salvador, and Honduras, and have signed agreements with most Latin American countries. Here's a small sample of the Fortune Global 500 firms that are present in Ecuador. There are several options for investing <coughs> in highly competitive industries that Ecuador offers, and I'll be more than happy to guide you on your plans to either export to Ecuador, invest in Ecuador, or even better, buy from Ecuador. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next, we're going to hear from the Consul General of Canada, James Villeneuve. Um, Consul General Villeneuve is Canada's senior representative in Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada. He was appointed Consul General of Canada, uh, Los Angeles, in February of 2014. He has served on many boards during his career, including the Toronto Economic Development Commission, the Metro Toronto Convention Center, the 2008 Toronto Olympic Bid, the Granville Island Trust, the Association of Canadian Advertisers, Carleton University, the Cana Canadian Club, Teach for America, the United Way, and the Regional Chamber and World Association in St. Louis. He received a bachelor's degree from Carleton University in 1985, and he's happily married to his wife, Kim, and they have two children, Grace and Andrew. Please join us and welcome him, Mr. David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and thank you to the port for having us and having me as a guest. It really is an honor to be here. And when I we were pra I was practicing the pronunciation. I, like, I'm sure I got it right. Um, how many people have been to Canada here? The whole world. Uh, I have this little expression, I'd say, uh, Canada's a bit like your attic, you know, the attic of your house. You forget it's up there, but when you go up, you go, wow, look at all this cool stuff. <laughs> and, and I'm heading to Vancouver tomorrow, and I know I'm going to have that reaction because every time I go back to Vancouver, I feel that way. So, um, And really, um, to, just to talk a bit about trade, for Canada, um, why do we trade? It's pretty simple. Um, it's a trading nation, and the country was formed by, um, you know, native populations integrate, integrating with European immigrants that really expanded and grew the country, both north and west. Um, so it's really in our DNA. Um, and also, we do trade a lot because our winters are not conducive to producing produce, or we get from here, <laughs> as an example. Um, so we really do have to trade. Um, and it's more than a matter of survival. Uh, we've always maintained our belief that Prosperity is driven by openness between nations um, and people buying and selling. Uh, what our country lacks in terms of a large domestic market, if you remember, the population of Canada is about the same as California, roughly 35 million people. Uh, we have a very diverse um, and entrepreneurial population that's always raised its ambitions way beyond its borders. Um, and there's three questions that I'll try and answer today. First, why we trade? Uh, why trade with Canada is good for the United States? Second, how we come to be so successful together. And third, how we need to adapt together for the future. And that includes NAFTA with our partners in Mexico and the United States. So I'm just going to talk a bit about the United States. Um, no two countries have a deeper, more beneficial relationship than Canada and the United States. And that really does include trade. Um, we share uh, $2 billion in trade every day across our borders. So it really is the largest trading relationship. Um, in the history of the world, when you look at just straight economies right now. Um, and it's balanced. Um, and actually, 
um, all this discussion of trade and trade imbalances. Um, our trade balance right now actually favors the United States by about 1%. Um, and it's valuable overall U.S. Um, Canada trade supports nearly 9 million United States jobs. Um, and what about the Central Coast, where we are right now? Um, there's 117 Canadian <coughs> companies operating in Chirac County alone, employing over 4,000 people. And we figure almost 85,000 jobs in Venture County are driven as a direct result of trade with Canada. And Wainimi continues to operate as a major port uh, for fruit and other products. Uh, many of uh, you will appreciate that we buy a lot of them. Um, <laughs> California is the top agricultural export market for Canada. Of all of California's strawberry exports, which I didn't realize this, but it makes sense, 70% of them are in Canada and 95% of uh, California spinach ends up in Canada, so a lot of smoothies are dried in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff that's grown within probably a few miles of here. Um, California wine, uh, we're the, actually the number two buyer of California wine in the world, only behind the European Union. And in fact, we buy four times uh, as much California wine um, as the next country on the list. So it's a very important um, export. California wines are by far and away the largest seller in Canada is now ex exceeding European wines with um, a lot of European culture. So your wine industry has done a good job marketing over the years to Canadians. Uh, so Canada-California trade contributes to an overall trade partnership that is massive, balanced, and essentially um, keeps people working on both sides of the board. Um, and just as important as the fact that we trade with each other is that we make things together. So more than just trade and exchange of goods, um, and some of this was touched on by my colleague from Mexico. Airplanes, cars, and other advanced manufacturing products routinely cross the border uh, between the United States, Canada, and Mexico numerous times on the way to completion, employing workers from uh, both sides of the border, uh, all three borders, as a matter of fact. Uh, shared supply chains, efficient energy markets, and a culture of innovation make our countries working together much more competitive in a global marketplace. And that's why we want to continue and expand trade. So now we ask, how do we get to this deal? Well, the answer is NAFTA. Um, Canada had a free trade agreement pre-NAFTA with the United States, and then Mexico was brought in post that. Um, and NAFTA really made this integrated economy possible. And as a result, this helped create the biggest, most competitive economic region in the world. <coughs> NAFTA countries make up about 7% of the world's population, so not that much, but 25% of the global GDP, or 27% of the global GDP. So now you say, well, that's just uh, that's just the strength of the United States. But the total amount of the trade between all three countries has quadrupled since 1993. So you could argue that it really is a team effort. Uh, NAFTA has opened up new export opportunities, acted as a stimulus to build internationally competitive businesses, and helped attract significant foreign investments uh, into all three of our countries. Um, and it really is the sum of all of the parts. Um, now, there's obviously been a lot of discussion on NAFTA recently in terms of um, its functionality and where does it go from here. Um, and we are prepared to improve NAFTA and work on changing things. Uh, we had, um, we met with Wilbur Ross last week um, here in Los Angeles, I'm extensively with him on going through a whole series of different issues. and. I mean, there's obviously some concerns in the United States, but I think the, the message that, and the exchange we had was one of constructive dialogue <laughs> in terms of moving forward, and it was quite positive. Um, and first, we can work to ensure that the benefits don't just accrue at the top of the biggest multinational companies. Um, in our country, um, small and medium-sized businesses really employ 90% of uh, private sector workforce. So we're active, actively working to help these companies export and also for U.S.-based companies to export into Canada. We meet regularly with uh, companies here that want to work in Canada's market, and we help them uh, get up there. Um, NAFTA has also shown that seamless trade will lead to the development of global value chains. These value chains often offer the best chance for smaller companies to grow uh, into other markets. Uh, the next part of the answer is that we can strengthen our partnership. We recognize, uh, in the words of our foreign minister, um, we are living in a, in a more protectionist moment internationally than we have been in a while. So while there's been all this tremendous growth and some of the discussions going on, there is some discussion and some echoes of protectionism that's going on. Um, and this is something we're gonna have to deal with and preserving and updating NAFTA is timely and will, it will succeed if we continue to make agreements a win-win-win scenario. Uh, despite all of our common interests, disputes are bound to emerge. Um, I, 
often look to Twitter now in the morning to see what dispute we're involved with. The U.S. government has taken aim at our software lumber industry as an example in our dairy industry. Um, but it's not, I mean, these disputes have gone on forever. It's not something that's new. In fact, NAFTA created a creative process for settling these disputes in front of the World Trade Organization. Software Lumber's example, Canada um, has won every time we've been gone to an appellate body that's ruled on it. So it's one of these things we're going to have to deal with going forward. Um, there is another one that's going on right now. When actual fact, our imports are five to one for our exports on milk from the United States. But but there's challenges, and we have people that are concerned and hurting, and you know, farmers maybe in the Midwest thinking, wanting to point at, at people, and we're getting pointed at that one, but I think we will defend ourselves on it. Um, but we can't lose sight of the fact that um, NAFTA has worked very well for all of us. Um, we are each other's largest uh, trading partners and source of foreign investments, and we rely like, we like deeply on each other for trades and jobs. Um, and you know, you think of NAFTA even to modernize it, there's um, exempt categories of professionals that can cross the border. NAFTA, when it was written, was pre computer So we have people now that are um, um, a lot of technolo technology professionals living here in California. Um, that we'd like to have ac better access to Canada and vice versa for our people as well. So that would be an example of a category that we've discussed as we talk about NAFTA um, and the update in technology. Um, the other thing for trade people here and certainly for ports is to make sure that our borders work well and that we continue with border cooperation. Um, one of the things that we've done with uh, Homeland Security here is try to make sure that the Canadian border and the U.S. border are thin, meaning if you're moving goods back and forth, that they can get across quickly and efficiently. And that includes people, where if you come to Canada, you pre-clearing Canada come down. That's been an investment that's gone on for decades with U.S. border security. It means that a um, you know, tourist in Vancouver that wants to come down to Disney World can come down with their family very easily, or a business person that wants to come down can do so, or a business person from here that wants to go up to Calgary can do so and get back and forth quickly. Um, it's, it, the information is shared, so we're really focused on keeping the bad people out, but moving the good people quickly, and that's a big infrastructure investment we make. Um, and that would also include single window movement of goods and services that we work with the ports on as well. Um, so really, we I think we make great strides in international trade. We want to continue to do so. Um, I'll just close by saying that in this part of the world, um, you have a lot of Canadians living mm -hmm. here too. It's our largest diaspora. Uh, in the world outside of um, our major cities. So with that, you end up with a lot of people that end up um, creating businesses and moving back and forth and understanding this market. So uh, I want to thank the port for having us and hopefully we can continue to do more business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Axel. Um, our next guest is the Consul General of the Republic of Bulgaria, Veselin Balchevs, and I hope that you've had the opportunity to meet with Donna. She slipped out of the room, right. but oh, there she is. This is our very own Bulgarian. So, <laughs> sure if you're aware of that, but she was born and raised there. Um, the Consul attended the Economic University in Berlin, Germany, and the University of World and National Economy in Sofia, Bulgaria, and graduated from the latter with a master's degree in international economic relations. He specialized extensively in the fields of economics and political science in Vienna, London, Moscow, Dublin, and Chicago. He's a graduate of the leadership program of the Harvard University JFK School of Government and has earned a certificate on strategic planning by the French National School of Administration. Chairperson of a council to the president of Bulgaria, of Bulgaria, he subsequently was head of the cabinet of the deputy prime minister and minister of foreign affairs. In 2009, he was appointed ambassador extraordinary of the Republic of Bulgaria to the Republic of Cyprus. After the completion of the mandate, he was appointed to, uh, secretary general of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Prior to his present position, he was ambassador at large and head of the home country sec sec uh, excuse me secretariat of the 38th Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting in Sofia in June 2015. Welcome, and we look forward to hearing your remarks. Thank you very much. I was impressed by my view. 
Uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your invitation. It's a pleasure being with you and uh, having the opportunity to present uh, my country. Uh, has anybody of you, except Donald, been to Bulgaria? Okay, three. I think you still have a, the rest of you still have a chance to correct this omission <laughs> and to improve Bulgaria in your travel plans. Uh, as a Consul General of Bulgaria, I'm covering 11 states, uh, West Coast, starting from Alaska and ending up with uh, Hawaii. Uh, it's a huge territory, but I would like to say that uh, Ventura County is the most picturesque and, and the hospitable one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Before starting my presentation, I would like, dear friends, to remember three things about my country. Three things. Number one, this is the oldest country in Europe which exists under the same name on the same territory. 1400 years. Number two, the Cyrillic alphabet was created in Bulgaria and today over 300 million people are writing and reading with the Cyrillic alphabet. Number three, Bulgaria is the only country in Europe which, during the Second World War, saved all the Bulgarian Jews. 50,000 lives were saved due to the brave actions of the Bulgarian people. 50,000 Bulgarian Jews were not sent to the concentration camps in uh, Nazi Germany. Thank you. Ah, and one more thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Since you're more uh, mostly uh, business people in this room, uh, there is a, sec a sacred cow for the business people called taxes and taxation. <laughs> Bulgaria has the lowest taxes in the European Union. A corporate tax, 10% flat. Individual tax, 10% flat. So don't hesitate to invest in it. <laughs> So, uh, well, uh, short information about uh, Bulgaria. I was warned that I don't have much time and uh, I will be uh, uh, quite quick in my presentation. Bulgaria is in the center, in the heart of the uh, Balkan Peninsula. It has an area which is around Ecuador. Right? It's uh, 110,000 uh, square kilometers. The population is about 8 million, seven and a half, as you see, and the capital of Bulgaria is, uh, uh, is Sofia. <coughs> Bulgaria is a member of the European Union. This is a market of uh, 500 million people, and Bulgaria is a member of NATO. So, in order to guess how strategic is, our, uh, is the location of Bulgaria, just see, Bulgaria is a gateway of Europe to the Middle East and uh, Asia, and vice versa. A gateway from Asia and from Middle East to Europe. Some of the microeconomic uh, indicators which uh, you can take note of. As you see, this is the GDP, which is constantly growing. And this is unemployment rate, which fortunately is going down. So, uh, there are two facts about Bulgaria which is also good for you to remember. That this is one of the best outsourcing, outsourcing destinations in uh, Europe. And it accommodates about 50 companies producing components and systems for the global car industry. Five reasons why to invest in Bulgaria. I could list, of course, ten more, but uh, these are the most important ones. First of all, this is the political and the business uh, stability. Uh, there is one fact that uh, Bulgaria is under the currency board, which means that uh, the banking system is uh, very sound. Uh, Bulgaria is, uh, has a very competing costs in uh, doing business. It has uh, good access 
to the major markets. Bulgaria has a very educated and skilled, skilled and uh, highly skilled workforce, labor force, and there are a very concrete governmental incentives for developing business and investing in, in Bulgaria. Uh, these are some uh, figures, some data about uh, the business environment according to the Doing Business uh, uh, 2016. As you see, Bulgaria is uh, sharing the 38th place. Taxation rate, once again, look at it. You can see in comparison to the other countries in Europe and in the, Euro and in the European Union, Bulgaria is having a corporate tax of 10% flat, and there is an individual tax of 10% flat. <coughs> On this map of Bulgaria, you can see a number of uh, industrial zones. As you see, there on the whole territory of, of the country. This is uh, uh, the foreign direct investment chart, which shows, of course, yeah, before the crisis in 2009-2010, uh, we have reached, uh, the foreign investments have reached about one-third of the GDP. Uh, now, slowly, step by step, step by step, but we are recovering the level of the uh, FDIs which are coming to Bulgaria. There is a special governmental policy towards the uh, foreign investments in Bulgaria. Um, the major one is the Investment Promotion Act, and this act is uh, uh, delivering a, a number of uh, incentives to the foreign to the foreign investors. I will not mention uh, and I will not read them out all of them, uh, but I will be ready to anyone who is interested to share this. Uh, presentation. When we finish, I will uh, give you also my business card and my addresses. These are a number of uh, administrative incentives which are given to the, uh, to the foreign investors. There are also financial investment incentives. And this is a list of some of the foreign companies which uh, are already well established uh, on our market in Bulgaria. Some figures, uh, some data about the export structure of uh, Bulgaria. As I told you at the beginning, the uh, outsourcing is uh, on a high level uh, in my country. About 42,000 people are employed in, in this uh, sector and uh, more over 3% of the GDP is uh, generated. Uh, these are data which concern the information uh, technology. Uh, as you see, over 18,000 specialists uh, work in this sector and uh, close to 2% are being of the GDP are being uh, generated by it. Uh, there are a number of uh, international uh, IT companies uh, which are uh, based, based in Bulgaria. And in general, I would say that uh, our IT sector is uh, developing uh, very fast. Some other uh, branches uh, of industry which are uh, being developed in Bulgaria. This is uh, electronic, uh, machine building, uh, food and beverages. By the way, Bulgaria is an agricultural country. And uh, it is also one of the uh, very important in Europe uh, wine producing countries. I know that speaking about wine in California, this is a challenge. <laughs> This is, uh, this is true, but just only to mention you that uh, uh, the major European uh, air companies like Lufthansa in the first and the business class are served only Bulgarian wines. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Perfumery and cosmetics, travel and uh, tourism. Well, uh, besides inviting you to, to visit my uh, country, uh, 
two very important facts about, uh, about tourism. Bulgaria is uh, ranking um, among the first countries in uh, hunting tourism. If there are people who are hunters, uh, Bulgaria is a good place uh, for you to go. And the second one, this is spa and health tourism. Bulgaria is having 800 natural uh, mineral water springs. Most of them are uh, very, uh, very good for, for, for the health. And uh, the spa tourism is uh, developing very rapidly, especially in the, in the last uh, decade. So, thank you very much. As you see, uh, thank you. In Bulgarian, this is Blogodaria. Donna knows what, uh, how to pronounce it. And uh, the uh, addresses of uh, the Ministry of Economy of Bulgaria and of the Consulate General of Bulgaria in uh, Los Angeles. Last but not least, I would like to, uh, to tell you that uh, a colleague of mine who is an economic advisor within our uh, consulate, Edward, he's sitting in the back way. Yeah? Uh, he's over there, and in case you're having some additional questions or you would like to get some additional information, don't hesitate. Uh, to contact us. Once again, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Um, now we're going to hear from the Trade Commissioner of Spain in Los Angeles, Manuel Bia. Um, he has broad experience in all aspects of public sector communications with a profound knowledge of marketing plan management in foreign markets. Commissioner Manuel earned his master's in public administration from Harvard University Kennedy School of Government in 1992. He has served as an economic advisor to the first vice president and ministry of economy of Spain from 2003 to 2004, and general director of labor for the regional government of Madrid from 2004 to 2006. He has also served as director of industrial products and technology at the Spanish Institute for Foreign Trade, and currently holds the title of economic and commercial counselor of the Embassy of Spain in Los Angeles. Commissioner Valle has been a strong advocate of growing Spain's business a presence in here in California. So thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me here to the port of Waimi. I learned that word uh, today. <laughs> okay. And uh, first of all, I would like to say that I agree completely with uh, what uh, has been said here before about uh, the importance of keeping global trade uh, as a way of uh, letting our people in the world live in poverty. So this is a responsibility that we all have with uh, the rest of the people in the world and, of course, uh, with the people of our countries. And, um, well, I'm going to run just a brief presentation about Spain. I don't know if you are one of the 75 million people that visit Spain last year. <laughs> Is anybody here that visited last year Spain? Uh, well, Spain is a member of the European uh, <coughs> Union, member of uh, the uh, NATO, and uh, uh, we uh, are the 14th largest economy in, the, in, in Europe. I think it's like this, no? Sorry, in the world, uh, the eleven exporter, and the third country in the world by tourists. Uh, and this is a, a, an important fact because uh, 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 compared to our population, uh, we get uh, double the people visiting every year than the population of Spain, pretty much. No? And that means that uh, we have uh, developed a state-of-the-art uh, uh, infrastructure eh, to, to, to make uh, our tourists happy. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that Spain has uh, around 3,000 uh, kilometers of high-speed train, uh, the largest network in Europe, uh, the second in the world, only to China, uh, state-of-the-art airports, and uh, many, many other infrastructure. Um, we uh, have 26 uh, out of the 500 uh, Forbes uh, biggest uh, largest companies in the world, 
So we have uh, quite a few uh, multinationals. <coughs> and we have an economy growing um, and very competitive. Um, these are some uh, uh, foreign companies uh, with headquarters in, in Spain. Uh, we have a lot of uh, international uh, organization uh, with headquarters also in Spain. And one thing that I want to uh, highlight about Spain is that uh, we sell ourselves, and I think with uh, a vision, as a platform to do business in Europe, in uh, Latin America. We are the second investor in Latin America, only um, after the United States. And also in uh, North Africa, uh, because of our proximity, and in uh, the Arab countries, because of our ties, uh, between our uh, royal families and well, historic ties. Uh, we are the, one of the few countries in Europe with uh, Arab roots, no? for 700 centuries, seven, seven centuries, we were an Arab country. No? So uh, these are uh, some of the multinationals you might recognize uh, maybe in the fashion sector, Zara, or, or some of our oil companies, or big banks. Uh, they are in the United States, uh, uh, Banco de Santander, BBVA, uh, sometimes with different names. No? Uh, we are very strong also in renewable energy, especially wind and solar. Uh, the second uh, wind uh, producer, uh, uh, energy producer from wind in the United States is from Spain, is Iberdrola and Grid, for instance. We are running several uh, solar parks uh, here in California, for instance. And we are very strong also in construction and concessions. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know if you are aware that uh, uh, six out of the 15 biggest construction companies are, are, are come from Spain. We, are, we have won uh, the first, uh, out of the three first uh, tranches of the high speed train here, we have been awarded to Spanish companies. Um, we have built the Panama Channel, the new Panama Channel. We are building the high speed uh, draining. Uh, Medina Mecca, or uh, I think Ankara, Ankara Istanbul, we are also involved. And um, well, uh, we are a very open economy, uh, only uh, second after Germany uh, in Europe. Uh, we have a trade balance, uh, uh, the trade balance of, a, of, of an industrial country. Uh, 2% uh, of GDP are cars. We are the second car producer of Europe. So, 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 something that maybe you don't know. Um, only Germany uh, is in front of us. We produce more cars than France, Italy, or, or the UK. And the first industrial car producer of Europe. Um, but we are even stronger with the services, more than in goods. Right? So our positions in the world ranking are better uh, when we talk about goods, uh, sorry, services. And uh, why we are so strong in, in Latin America, as, as I said, well, because of our uh, historical and language uh, ties. I mean, I can speak much better in Spanish, <laughs> I promise you, than in English. <laughs> and, uh, and because it was our training camp, our companies, uh, because we don't speak very well English, uh, went to Latin America <laughs> before they came to the US. Now we are uh, very strong in the U.S. and you would be surprised to uh, how many infrastructure projects we are running or developing in, in the U.S., for instance. Eh? Uh, how well are doing all these companies that I have mentioned before in, in the U.S. But anyway, uh, Latin America uh, has been our training camp and for the last 30 years we are running water companies, uh, airports, uh, subways, uh, electric companies and many, many uh, tele, uh, telecom companies and many things, uh, many more things. No? And uh, you can see here that uh, uh, our first uh, investment partner is the United States, eh? but you see that uh, Brazil, Mexico uh, are very, very uh, on the top of our list. No? And uh, we are also uh, home for some of the biggest multinationals uh, from Latin America. Eh? So, this relation goes in both uh, directions. And we have signed many, many uh, tax agreements mm -hmm. with uh, the area, and of course with uh, the rest of the world that makes uh, this possible. Uh, and our <coughs> with uh, uh, the North uh, Africa countries, and I have already explained it, and just to say that uh, when we talk about taxes, we try to be as moderate as possible, but we have a very um, 
a modern society. Uh, we, we have a universal uh, healthcare system for everybody, a universal uh, uh, education system for everybody, and somebody has to pay for that. No? Uh, and we brag about uh, the quality of life uh, in Spain. No? Uh, I mean, people from Spain, apart from enjoying having Real Madrid, eh? <laughs> winning uh, every year, no? <laughs> the European champions. Eh? Uh, we have many, many other things that make us, our, our country uh, very, very like uh, Florida or, or the California. Eh? In fact, uh, I, am, I feel at home in California because uh, a lot of parts of, of Spain we, uh, reminds me a lot of the Mediterranean coast in, in Spain. In fact, uh, California was part of Spain, eh? no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that we developed the Camino Real. Eh? So we are uh, um, willing and um, we hope that we develop the high speed train. Eh? No. Okay, and um, finally, just to uh, welcome you in uh, my country, eh? these are some uh, examples of the uh, infrastructure. Eh? You will be amazed uh, if you go uh, and you see especially the, the high speed uh, network that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now we have. Um, Raphael Hals, um, who is the Trade and Investment Commissioner of Belgium with us. Um, he is the Consul General of Belgium in Los Angeles, where his jurisdiction covers the western states of the United States. Within the consulate, he represents Flanders Investment and Trade, an agency of the Government of Flanders, the Northern region of Belgium, which stands for more than 80% of Belgium's export. He and his team have a double focus helping Belgian companies do business in the USA, and helping American companies set up or expand their presence in Europe. The commissioner has been based in Los Angeles since August of 2016, coming from Istanbul, Turkey, where he was based for eight years in a similar role. He holds a master's degree in communication and a postgraduate degree in business administration, both from the KU Lev Laboon, if I say that correctly, Lupin University. Welcome. Thank you, first of all, to the Board of Renemy for inviting me here. One uh, slight correction, if I heard it right, you mentioned me being Consul General. That's not exactly right. <laughs> anyway, I have the title of Consul, but basically my role is Trade Commissioner. Okay. Um, so, let me... Sorry. We promoted you. Yeah, you promoted <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Now let me tell you a thing or two about my country. I'm sure there's a few things that all of you know about Belgium. We have our Belgian chocolates, and we have our Belgian beer. Basically, we're so good in beer that the largest brewer in the world, and the horse of the the largest brewing group, is part Belgian, part American, and the headquarters is in Belgium. So this is where we are situated, in between France, Germany, the Netherlands, and with the UK on the other side of the North Sea. Capital is Brussels. Um, these are some figures. Our gross domestic product last year was 467 billion US dollar, which puts us around 25th somewhere in the world rankings. Three regions, Flanders, Brussels, and Wallonia. Um, it's not too important. I'm always proud to indicate, because I'm from Flanders, the northern region of the country. So I'm always proud to indicate that we do, uh, with Flanders, we do more than 80% of exports and imports. These are the total trade figures um, from last year. There were some 20 billion, these are figures in euros, um, some 21 billion going from Belgium to the USA and some 27 billion going from the USA to Belgium. Again, this is um, the split of the different regions, but I'm not going to go on that. Then the sectors um, from Flanders, these are figures for Flanders, but like you saw, it's more than 8%, so it doesn't make big difference in, in percentages, etc. Um, for Flanders to the USA, more than 50% is in chemicals and pharmaceuticals. And uh, machinery, electronic devices is the second category, transport equipment is a third. 
Um, maybe point out the gems, precious stones, and metals is there as well, because mainly because Antwerp is such an important city in the international uh, trade in diamonds. The other way around, again, chemicals and pharmaceuticals stand for almost half of uh, the trade flow, and machinery and electronic devices is second, with plastics coming third. If you add plastics to the chemicals, then the whole category of plastics, chemicals, pharmaceuticals is even 60%. So that is very big. Services, because first, uh, what came before, of course, was goods. Then if you look at services, the things are not that large. Um, but still, 2015, there was a services exports of 10 billion from Belgium to the USA, 7 billion in the other way. Some snapshots, snapshots, sorry. Uh, we have four seaports, Antwerp, Zeebrugge, Kent, and Ostend. Antwerp is the biggest of these. Um, it is, I think, the second port in the northwestern <coughs> part of uh, Europe, right behind Rotterdam. Right, going much faster than Rotterdam, so much so that our Dutch neighbors from Rotterdam are jealous about our work. <laughs> Um, I think Chiquita goes to, they definitely go to Belgium. I'm not sure if it is Antwerp or Seebrugge. Yeah, Seebrugge, I think, yeah. yeah. But it's in uh, it is Belgium, yeah. Um, one more thing about Antwerp. Um, it is Europe's largest petrochemical cluster. It is, uh, used to be number two after Houston. Houston is still number one, but in the meantime, China and Saudi Arabia have developed bigger things than what we have in Belgium. It's still the number four, so that's quite good. Um, you see that we have more than chocolate and beer. We have world-class R&D and innovation. IMAC is a uh, leading nano electronics research institute with some between 2,500 and 3,000 researchers from all over the world. Um, if you talk to anyone in Silicon Valley about IMAC, they know it, and many of them have been doing um, partnerships with it. Of course, this is Belgium as well. So if you want to do business with Belgium, this is the bonus you get if you come there. Why would you opt for Belgium? Why would you go to Belgium? Why would you do business with Belgium? Because we are at the heart of Europe. If you make this circle of so many kilometers, then you see how many consumers there are. Total European population, it has been mentioned before by um, our Bulgarian colleague, I think, is more than 500 million people. Total European GDP is 16.5 trillion US dollars. So we are a huge market. Not fair, we are out. Sorry? Not fair, we are out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's the reason why we should go to your country as well. Because we don't too much. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Uh, we heard impressive things about China earlier today from Mr. Jay Tsao. Um, and I'm jealous of the growth that is realized in China and in Southeast Asia, etc. But still, if you look at these figures, um, and if you look at purchasing power per, per head of population, for instance, Europe is still ahead of uh, the Southeast, Southeast Asian economies. And so it makes sense to think about Europe and not just focus on China and Southeast Asia. I'm not going to go into all of these details. This may be interesting for you as well. Um, we are a small country. You have seen the size. It's not big. The population is 11 million. But we are, um, thanks to these conditions, we are, I think, a perfect test market. And there are some big international groups that use our country as a test market. We have our infrastructure for logistics. I was talking about our ports. We have our airports, our railroads, our roads. Um, again, Port of Antwerp is, is very important for the whole of the northwestern part of Europe. You can service in 24 to 48 hours, you can service all of these countries in there. Spain is included. <laughs> um, and we do have an excellent location for setting up a European distribution center. These are some of the uh, companies, big international and multinationals, that have been doing so. Mikey is one of them, Procter & Gamble, Samsung, Apple. You see all their names, I'm not going to read them all for you here. Um, but we have yeah, we have so many of them thanks to our location and our <laughs> infrastructure. 
IP because it is known probably to, yeah, I mean, every one of you and because they are almost neighbors of California coming from Oregon. They have their European Logistics Center in Flanders. They have 3,000 people working there for them now. So it is a huge operation. It um, serves the whole of Europe, plus uh, Middle East, plus part of North Africa, um, plus Russia. So it's a really huge operation. Um, these are some comments that the general manager of that uh, plant was, was, was giving um, as to why Nike had opted for Flanders. Taxation, I'm not going to dwell too long on that. If you look at our nominal corporate tax rate, 34%, it doesn't look too well. Um, but that is nominal. There are so many deductions and rules and regulations to lower your tax or your taxable base that in the end, what a company on average effectively pays, and that is the effective corporate tax rate, it is quite in line with what the surrounding countries are doing. It's not as good as our Bulgarian colleague was saying, it's not 10%. Um, but the good news about Belgium is that, like you are talking here about reducing corporate tax rate from 35 to wherever it may be, 15%. Um, same discussion is going on in Belgium. And probably in, I don't know, I'm not going to say coming months, but coming year or something, there will be a uh, serious uh, lowering of the corporate tax rate in our country as well. Then I can promote my country, but I think it is best to conclude with a um, comment from other people. And this is what UKTI says about Flanders, UKTI, so the UK Trade and Investment Office. It praises our Anglo-Saxon culture. They say it's close by. For you, of course, it's a little bit further. Um, they praise our logistics. They say we are a gateway to the rest of Europe. And that is indeed the main uh, message that I have for you today. I think that is most important. If you uh, target Europe, Belgium is a good gateway. We're a good test market that we have going to live with people. And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll give you my details. I know it's two o'clock, but I think that we start off a little bit late, so um, we'll have you out of here probably in about 15 minutes. We'll hear from our friend from Turkey, and then we'll, we'll wrap things up with a Bruce's quick presentation and our, our special award. So without further ado, though, and last but not least of all of our guests from around the world, I'd like to introduce Sarper Somnes from Turkey. He's in the Consular Office of Economic Relations of, Tur of the Turkish Consul General in Los Angeles. Consular Somnes is native to Turkey, and his current post in Los Angeles marks his first time representing Turkey abroad. He's additionally been working for the Turkish Consulate for three years. So welcome, and we're glad to have you here with us today. and it's a pleasure to be here with you. So I would like to introduce briefly Turkey's investment climate and why invest in Turkey. So these are the 10 most important reasons to invest in Turkey, ranging from robust economy to favorable demographics. Turkey's geostrategic location provides investors in Turkey easy access to markets around Turkey as well. So the domestic market is connected with the key markets not only through the customs union or free trade agreements, but also it's geographically and logistically well connected with the rest of the world. Turkey's population is right now 80 million or 81 million people, so it is, has a growth with 1.3%. So Turkey stands out as the 16th largest economy in the world. And Turkey's economic growth has been based on strong macroeconomic fundamentals with successful management of finance. 
The growth has generated a significant economic activity, a vibrant domestic market, and a lucrative export opportunities. Turkey's domestic market is further supported by emerging urban centers across Turkey. There are around like 20 urban centers with population over a million. In addition to the domestic market, Turkey's custom union with the European Union and free trade agreements with 27 countries enable investors in Turkey to access a combined market of almost a billion people without any customs or trade restrictions. Many multinational companies have chosen Turkey as a manufacturing and management hub in the region, using Turkey as a supreme port to access regional markets. Turkey has implemented comprehensive reforms in many areas and continues to introduce new reforms according to the economic needs and changing conditions. Turkey has improved its investment climate through reforms offering investors protection and equal treatment. Turkey's relation with the European Union has improved Turkey's investment climate. Turkey has also offers lucrative incentives ranging from manufacturing incentives to research and development and innovation support. Turkey is well aware of the need for research and development investments in order to move up the value chain. So the incentives are categorized in four sections, such as general incentives, regional incentives, incentives with large-scale investments, and incentives with the strategic investments. The new law, which contains around like 82 articles, was drafted to facilitate Turkey's achievement of its long-term macroeconomic targets. Some of those targets include increasing its share in global trade, ensuring the security of supply, encouraging investors to conduct business in Turkey, and improving the rank in production, information, technology, and innovation. So to benefit from the research and development incentives, companies are supposed to establish a research and development centers in Turkey. Today, many global companies are conducting research and development activities in Turkey and benefiting from the incentives. Turkey offers a great opportunity in a variety of sectors, <laughs> such as automotive, machinery, energy, and beverage and agri-food. So the foreign investors from all around the world have been flocking to Turkey. As a result, Turkey attracted a tremendous amount of foreign direct investment over the past 13 years. So these are the some companies and statistics about the uh, uh, United States companies that are manufacturing on having facilities in Turkey and I'm happy to say that US companies is, have been part of Turkey's success story in the attracting FDIs. Turkey and the US develop strong commercial and economic relations. Today there are more than 1700 United US companies actively investing in Turkey. The stock value of their investments in Turkey has reached $12 billion, and we are committing to increase that further. So thank you for your understanding. Well, it's just great to hear from so many voices from folks representing so many different countries. I just find it fascinating, and we learn so much from what others are doing. So thank you all of you for, for joining us today and taking time to share. Um, so we're going to have Bruce Stensley come up. Bruce is the um, Executive Director of the Economic <coughs> Development Collaborative here in uh, uh, Ventura County. 
He is the machine that keeps our economy moving. Um, he's uh, got his arms in every different sector that, that makes our, our county move in terms of being an economic engine and economic force here in California. So welcome, Bruce, and we look forward to you. your, your uh, research report. Well, thank you, Kristen, and staff and members of the court and everyone for still being here. So I'm going to go very old school. Before you leave tonight, I'd like for you to grab a copy of a draft report that we have up here from the World Trade Center on issues related to agriculture. But to tie this together, I usually don't try and tell the book, but I can't help it. I'm going to spend one of my four minutes doing that. So earlier, I was inspired by the comments from BMW, and I was going to order online, inspired by Jay, a customized BMW. While I was doing that, exactly at that moment, Martin was asking his question about safety, and I think I just deposited $28,000 into your account, and I want you to thank Jay for that. I'm not sure how that happened, but I was trying to do some e-commerce. So here's the deal. You've been hearing about all this cool stuff in the global world. We're going to bring this down for just a couple of minutes to the local economy, and I'm representing a partnership today that is dedicated to work through the World Trade Center of the Oxnard Harbor District and of the Oxnard Regents for Oxnard and, or, excuse me, Ventura and Santa Barbara counties. And the issue for us is to try and figure out in World Trade Center two things. For local businesses, what can we do to help them think, act, and succeed in the global economy? And then, of course, for the region, how can we accelerate competitive, competitiveness, prosperity, and opportunity for the region and business generally? And looking at that, we've developed, point two, a partnership that is led, of course, by the Port of Miami and the Oxnard Harbor District that not only has, of course, physical infrastructure to accelerate and optimize trade, but the leadership, the expertise, the knowledge, and the trade partners that help us do that. Our role in this at the EDC is through our Small Business Development Center. We have talent through folks like Jay who work with us as consultants and we're working with already firms at all over Ventura County and Santa Barbara County who are invested in international and global trade. And third is Kirk Lesh still here. Kirk, he may not, there he is in the corner. A partnership with California Lutheran University, Center for Economic Research and Forecasting, the School of Management, has technical expertise to look at data and information about what's going on in the global economy locally. So the third point, we looked at agriculture as the first sort of adventure in trying to figure out could we get some information that will help us do our job and retain, attract, and um, grow business in the region? So why agriculture? Just a couple of points there that you should remember. So if you know that Ventura County is roughly a 50 to $55 billion economy, that's local GDP, the ag product or the ag economy in Ventura County is a good three and a half um, billion dollars. And Export economy, not ag, but the export economy of Ventura County is around $6 billion. So you see a huge piece of that, a billion of the $6 billion that are export product from Ventura County are connected to the ag economy. For an idea of that significance, and I'm nearly out of your way, consider the following. If you look at all of the export regions around the entire United States, looking at metropolitan <coughs> statistical areas, Ventura County is number five in the nation in the volume of value, rather, of export product. Santa Barbara County, eighth in the nation. We trail only just a handful of places. Kern County, our neighbor, Fresno County, Monterey County, um, Tulare County, and then it's Ventura and a couple of others, and then Santa Barbara. It's massive. So finally, what did we learn? We talked to you about I don't know, we focused on around 40 different um, major ag exporters and we learned several major things. Number one, they have huge brand recognition, which is an advantage that we need to work in a public-private partnership with commerce and others to make sure we're taking huge advantage of what we already have. Secondly, shipping costs are an issue to them. We know the port's working on op opportunities to lower those shipping costs. We're talking about aggregation. We're talking about applying technical expertise specifically to an interesting point which Jay, I think, highlighted for us, which is the rapidly changing means of commerce, rapidly changing market opportunities, so technical expertise and partnership for firms in the global economy and ag, um, exports particularly. Um, we want to do more of that through this specific location. And finally, what we really discovered through what Jay was talking about and others and with this global emerging middle class is there's this huge opportunity <coughs> 
in processed foods, I think you mentioned almonds and dried berries. And Ventura County is not particularly active in that. We could be far more active, but as e-commerce becomes more and more the platform, as the value of our branded products in agriculture become more and more valuable globally, we see that that fifth and eighth place for Ventura County, not only do we want to hang on to it, but we think we can grow it. And based on the information that we've gathered, the partnerships that we see in this room and around the region, we think we can do that. And we want to sell it to you seven folks, of course, who just spoke before me. Thank you very much. Grab the draft report, and you'll find some of that information, and we hope to have that <coughs> formally very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so for our last um, activity of today, um, every year we like to recognize and celebrate the success of our port customers. And so this year our Port Export Achievement Award goes to Five Diamond Cold Storage for their excellence in export. So I'm never bring that up, but I'd like to tell you that Five Diamond Cold Storage is a team of international growers packers, importers, exporters, and distributors with a combined turnover of more than $200 million annually. Five Diamond has shipped over 1,000 TEUs in a year through the Port of Wainimi, using all of the three different weekly services of the port to Central and South America. We appreciate their support. The fruit that is brought through the Port of Wainimi is handled with the utmost care and priority and we are glad to see that local California exporters are seeing the benefits of using their local port. Closer to the farm, sensible vessel cutoffs, quicker to the market, reliable weekly services, and great customer service are key for the fresh fruit customers in our area. We value the partnership we have created with Five Diamond Cold Storage and our partners Del Monte, Chiquita, Great White Fleet, Sea Land, and Channel Islands who are handling their business in Wainimi, and this is a well-deserved award. We look forward to working with you in the future and increasing the exports through our port. Congratulations. Okay, guys, to fight diamond is a honor to receive this award. We really appreciate the distinction, the surprise for a year of work for us as a team with our personal and sister companies in Central America and South America, the growers of California, Washington, and Central America, our suppliers, and the same line as Sealand, Mego Chipping, Mego Feet, and all the people make our business us business partners. And we want to say thank you to the people of the world of Wainini and all these people who make fake diamond change the products our, to our customer in a timely manner. We really appreciate your support, and in the name of fake diamond, to the authority of the Port of Wainimi and the present, we want to say thank you to having us today and receive this so award. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your support. You're welcome. Excuse me. So with that, I um, apologize for running a little late and uh, happy that you all stayed here um, to see everything. A couple of things. There's a flyer on your table for an event that we have coming up next week. So uh, we welcome you to that and come out and see all the really cool technology that's happening. And don't forget the Banana Festival at the end of September. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day.